Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you're joining us from. Uh, this is our International Save the Vaquita Day. I wanted to start this uh, whole thing off with a land acknowledgement where we're um, coming to you from today is in Vancouver, British Columbia. And so I want to acknowledge that we are honored to be on the traditional unceded territory of the Coast Salish, the Salwatooth, Shimanus, Kite, Statlo, and Musqueam Nations. Many of you are joining us from all over the world, so from many different places, but we are so excited that you're joining us today to talk about Vaquita. We have so much planned. We're going to share with you about uh, researchers who are still working around the clock to better protect these animals. Uh, for anyone who themselves just loves these animals, wants to protect them, you're in the right place. So thank you for joining us. My name is Lauren. I'm the host of Not a Dolphin, a podcast that we have been creating to try to talk about porpoises more, uh, give them a bit more attention than they tend to get. But uh, we are focusing once again today on vaquita. So we're going to start this off by I'm going to pass you over to Thomas Jefferson from Viva Vaquita. Thank you, Lauren. And good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Jefferson. Uh, I'm the director of Viva Vaquita. We're based in San Diego, California. And uh, with our colleagues, the Porpoise Conservation Society, we focus on conservation specifically of the vaquita, but of course are interested in conservation of all endangered small cetaceans. So for those of you who may not be that familiar with the vaquita, uh, let me first of all explain to you a bit about what the vaquita is. I'm sure probably most of you are familiar with it, but. The vaquita is a small species of purpose. It's one of only seven species found in the world. And it has the distinction of being the most endangered uh, marine mammal in the world. Unfortunately, there's only about 10 individuals left, according to our most recent population estimates. So it's very close to extinction. But as you hear, I think repeatedly today, uh, the situation is not hopeless. Vaquitas still have a chance to survive. And part of what we're doing today is to try to educate people and get people motivated to help us work to make sure that we give the vaquita every single chance it has to survive. So first thing I want to say uh, besides that is that National Save the Vaquita Day is something that's been going on for about 10 years. Sorry, uh, yeah, 10 years. This is actually our 10th event, and we've started in 2013, and 
um, we used to do this as a live event where we had booths set up all over the world so that people could come and see models of the Kivas, um, get educational materials, uh, watch videos, do various other things, participate in events. There were children's games and uh, musical guests in some cases. But because of COVID for the last couple of years, we've had to change our plan, and we're now doing International Save the Bikini Day as a virtual event. So today's event will be a four-hour event um, with a number of live stream presentations, including several talks by experts on marine mammals. And at the end, we're going to have a panel discussion so that uh, people who have questions in the audience can send in questions via the text box and we will, uh, then pose those questions to our expert panel at the end of the presentation so that people have a chance to answer those. So Lauren, uh, do, you want, uh, do you want me to say anything else at this point or should we uh, move on? Whoop. Just trying to organize myself. Um, yeah, Tom, we are ready to go with our next speaker. I'm, I'm trying to find my list and I'm excited to know who our next speaker is. Just give us one moment. Before we uh, go there. Um, there's a couple of important messages that we want to get out about the Vikita. Uh, these might be repetition for most of you who have uh, quite a bit of experience with the Vikita. But for those of you who are new to the issue, it's important to recognize that there's really only one threat that is All right, um, so we are going to be introducing our next speaker. Thank you so much for starting us off, Tom Jefferson. Uh, our first speaker here today is going to be Tom Keekfer. Uh, this is an introduction of <coughs> marine mammals and uh, specifically it looks like Tom is with Save the Whale. So I wanna to introduce Tom. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Great, thanks very much. Is my volume okay, Marcus? Okay. Yes, it is, we can all hear you. Okay, great. Okay, so I have been asked to talk about the introduction to marine mammals, and boy, I realize it's a large topic. I'm gonna to try to condense it and give you an overview and some of the highlights. But yes, I work with Save the Whales. We're located in Monterey, California, and um, we do a lot of outreach programs, but I also help Tom Jefferson out with Viva Vaquita, and so we're doing a lot of work now, like today, okay? So I think I better start. Um, first of all, I wanted to just dive in with the whales here and show you a wonderful video written, um, filmed and edited by Sally Bartell. And um, I thought it would just get an appreciation of their world and the ocean.
Okay, so first of all, I want to go over what what are marine mammals, and I all I know you all know this, but some of you that might not is that they are mammals like we're mammals, but they live in the ocean. We call them marine, um, or some live in freshwater like the Amazon River dolphins, but um, most of them live in the marine environment, and they all breathe air through their lungs. So. They, when they dive underwater, just like we do, they, we hold our breath and then we have to come up to the surface to breathe air. Okay, then the next thing, they give birth to live young. They're not laying eggs like sea turtles and, and reptiles. And then also they produce milk um, for the, to nurse their young. And that's very important, very different. And then they all have hair, at, at least at some point in their lifetime. They'll all have hair. And we're going to be talking about that. And then they are warm-blooded. They maintain their body heat. There are over 132 species of marine mammals. And right now, I'm going to to categorize them and to classify them, and they classify them into different groups, scientists. And this is a fun poster from Peppermint Narwhal that I wanted to show you. Um, it, it illustrates it nicely. They have these different groups. The first group are the sea otters and marine otters. There are two there. Um, then the polar bear is also considered a marine mammal. It has webbing in between its feet. It has adaptations for swimming in the ocean. And then our pinnipeds. Um, we actually have only one in there, the walrus, but there are um, 14 sea lions or the eared seals. And then we have our true seals or no ears are about 18 of this, the true seals. Then we have our ceridians, the dugongs and manatees, and there are four species there. But the cetaceans, oh my gosh, 92 different species of cetaceans, whales, dolphins, and porpoises. And um, that is, you know, just something we're going to focus on. For this talk, we're going to focus more on the closest relative to the vaquita and um, focus on them. And I think this is all kind of to scale. It's kind of interesting. We've got little porpoises here, and then we have dolphins and whales, but they're missing the largest whale. And I think I know why they didn't include it in the poster, because they are two times bigger than any of these animals, and they are huge weighing up to 160 tons in weight, and the large, the longest whale was 110 feet, where our humpbacks can get to about 55 feet, so they're actually double the size. So now we're going to just kind of narrow it down because time is limited in this talk, and we're going to talk about the cetaceans. This is a wonderful poster by Yuko Gorder, and it's, I know, if hopefully you're not all using iPhones or phones, because this is going to be hard, but I think just helping you a little bit, all facing right are all the baleen whales, and then facing to the left are all the odonocetes, the toothed whale and dolphins. And I'm just going to break this down a little bit. Hopefully it will help. This is an ex but there are over 15 species, there are 15 species of baleen whales present today. And this is all the scale. So you can see the blue whale, the largest whale on earth. And uh, we also have the fin whale, the second largest whale. Um, gray whales we have in Monterey, usually migrating through um, Monterey. And then they, we also have, uh, well, we don't see, we have seen the right whale, but the bowheads live way up in the Antarctic. Okay, and then we have toothed whale and dolphins. There are over 70 species. They've really radiated their species. And um, we have 
Out of that 70, there are actually 24 of these really strange looking whales called the beaked whales. And this is a Cuvier's beaked whale that actually outcompetes the other toothed whale, the largest toothed whale, the sperm whale, which is up here. And um, then we have 37 different species of, of dolphins. And to consider that that once upon a time, 50 million years ago, they lived on land. We think the closest relative today would be like a hippopotamus. They ventured in the ocean and started adapting and changing to their environment. And um, yes, and then we have lots of dolphins. And the porpoises, we have seven different species of porpoise. They're listed up here. And let me blow this up for you a little bit. And here is the vaquita, and they are the smallest of all the marine, marine mammals, or the cetaceans, I should say. The sea otter is the smallest of all the marine mammals. And the harbor porpoise is next, and next in line. They're very similar size to the vaquita, but vaquita are considered the smallest marine mammal. Okay, so I'm going to highlight go over just some of the adaptations that these whales have to survive in the ocean and how they've evolved over time. And we're going to talk about the mysticetes first, the baleen whales. And I just want to cover over some of their feeding adaptations. This is like a blue whale. They're lunge feeders. They find krill in the water column and they just lunge for the food. Where um, gray whales, they're the exception, they're bottom grubbers, or they're actually like big vacuum cleaners, and they suck these big pits out of the mud, feeding on these little amphipods. So they're also filtering because all of these whales have baleen, because they're called baleen whales, and they're filtering mud and water out of their of the mouths. And then we have the right whale and also the bowhead whale are known as skim feeders and they actually have an opening there. They're kind of like a whale shark, just cruising through the water, letting all of this food, but they're feeding on even smaller things than the blue whales, only copepods, which are much smaller. And their baleen can be up to 14 feet tall, and it's just incredible. And other whales will actually work in groups, which we'll talk about with the humpback whale. Okay. Baleen. What is baleen? It's a fingernail material. It's the same material as our fingernails. And this is in the inside of the mouth, the fringed area. And we'll just kind of go over this a little bit. Baleen just hangs from the roof of the mouth. There's nothing on the bottom of the mouth. And there are these individual plates. But if you pick your fingernail, the same material, and we think the tongue creating friction inside the mouth creates hair like a hair product, and that acts as a big strainer. And what they do is they take in big volumes of water, sucking it up and all their prey, and then they expel the water um, out using their tongue and their throat has muscles in it that we think are pressing it against the palate, pushing out all the water, but all the food stays trapped, much like a big strainer, okay? All right, so krill are amazing. There are more krill in the ocean than the biomass of humans on Earth, and I I'm not sure, that might just be in Antarctica, but yeah, krill are very abundant. And the blue whale, the largest whale on earth, only feeds on krill. The second largest whale, fin whale, will switch to fish. But as soon as krill sets up, they go after krill. It's a really pure source of food. There are the primary consumers feeding on all the phytoplankton and they're low on the food chain. Okay, and one of the things interesting, this is what krill does. They aggregate in big swarms. This is looking up at the surface, being under a krill swarm, and you can see a whale would probably target that dark area and um, get a lot of food in one gulp. 
But interestingly enough, fish, when you scare fish or corral fish um, using bubble curtains or bubble nets like humpbacks, it scares them into a tight ball and allows them to feed on a lot more food in one gulp. So this is a blue whale. I have to mention they are three school buses long, big buses, 100, you know, um, 110 feet was the largest whale. They're typically about 70 to 80 feet now, but they did discover when they used to hunt blue whales. And they can distend their, relax their throat, and when they take in all this water, they create a big pouch. From the tip of their chin all the way down to the umbilical cord, they can blow, they have these throat grooves that blow up. And the best way to describe this is a little video from Archive. And this is from an airplane. And remember, it's three school buses long. All the orange in the water is krill. And now you're going to see the krill are trying to escape. But there the whale is blown up like a big balloon. His eyes there, the chin's up there. There's his pectoral fin. And the umbilical cord or belly button is right there. His tail is way back there. They are taking in a pool size of water. I mean, that's how much water they consume in one gulp. And then with those throat grooves, they press out all the water and their baleen traps all those tiny krill. So even though they're feeding on such tiny things, they aggregate um, the krill into swarms. Now, humpbacks are a little different. This is right out here in Monterey Bay where I live. You can see they have throat grooves as well, and they're all working together as a team, corralling anchovy up to the surface. You can see some of the anchovies and birds getting involved. And you're going to see the anchovy trying to escape. They use the surface as a barrier. Oh. There's a lot of communication that they do, talking to each other, coordinating that effort, because if one whale goes, it will scare the fish away. So they really need to work together as a team. Okay, on to the toothed whale and dolphins. They are very different than the baleen because they actually have teeth. And this is obviously an orca. And you can see they have conical teeth. They're not very sharp. They're used more for tearing and ripping, but they still grab fish and be able to swallow them. Where other dolphins have lots of tiny teeth. And in, in fact, the, the long beak common dolphin has over 240 teeth in their mouth. And they're very sharp. And they actually use those for just grasping food, biting um, prey, fish usually, and then they'll swallow it whole and they don't have any chewing, obviously no molars for chewing. And that's very interesting. Um, so these are dolphins in the dolphin. And by the way, the orca is the largest member of the dolphin family. Um, so it's scientifically in the dolphin family. And that's the problem we have with common names. We call anything big, we call it dolphin. We call a whale, like the whale shark. Okay, and what classic adaptations we see with dolphins. I mean, they're fusiform. They're like a bullet through the water. And they have their flukes and back. They modified. They're no longer legs um, like they once had, but they have this tail that goes up and down not like a fish the sideways. And then their pec fins, you can still see all the bones, but they've been modified into fins for steering, they use that. They have a back fin for a dorsal fin, and that helps them stabilize in the water because when they get really going, going really fast, that fin stabilizes them, it's like the keel of a sailboat. Now, when they go really fast, they leap out of the water. And these are two common dolphins leaping out of the water. And then notice the other adaptation. The blowhole is on the top of the head. Now, dolphins just have one blowhole, the toothed whales. But um, the baleen whales, or much bigger like a blue whale, have two nares or nostrils. 
Okay. And then kind of look at their eyes are located on either side of the head. Now, scientists were wondering, there's a big blind spot in front, but then that's where they discovered that they're actually making vocalizations and echolocation clicking, which we're going to talk about, um, through their forehead, which we call the melon, and their little little sacs in their air sacs and little um, vibrating uh, structures in there that allow them to send out sound. But then listen, they they no longer have ears. Um, I mean, they don't hear that way anymore, too. They do have a little ear hole on either side, but it is clogged with wax. I pulled out a candlestick out of a humpback's ear, but they've modified their hearing to hear through their lower jaw and then into their inner ear. And um, this is really fascinating. So they've taken advantage of sound in the ocean. They can see much further with sound and communicate much further with sound than they can um, by seeing, because a lot of times it's got a lot of food in the water or prey, and it's very difficult to see. So they really are amazing. Uh, okay. Now, I just want to play you about how they see with sound, which we call echolocation. And I'm going to play you a recording of an orca tracking an object, and um, we're going to be hearing it click. You're going to hear the clicks getting faster and faster. So it's sending clicks and then it's listening to the echo coming back. And it basically, well, how we see images, it's seeing images with sound, just like we have um, ultrasound and safe ways of learning. We've learned so much, and bats can are doing this as well. Um, I'm playing an orca uh, because they have a lower frequency call. Um, a lot of our dolphins are are much higher pitch sounds, and even our porpoises are way out of our hearing range. We can hear from about 20 hertz to about 20 kilohertz, and um, Porpoises are actually making sounds really um, up to the 150 kilohertz range. So let's listen to this. It's a little hear easier to hear the clicks. He kind of loses interest in the object, so he breaks from the clicks. There's a, a Y call. That's actually an APOD up in Vancouver, their family call. Now he's going to start tracking in on the object, and he's getting really close to this that I don't want him to eat. Here the click's getting faster and faster. And he turns and he goes down the channel. And so it was kind of give you an idea of how they're using sound to see their environment. Now they also communicate. And these are one of my favorite dolphins. We have the Pacific white-sided dolphins. These are, which are related to the dusky dolphins that Barrett Worsig took a picture of. But they love to feed on anchovy. And these Dolphins are working together as teams, corralling all of these fish. Now we have a lot of squid too in our oceans and they primarily will feed on squid as well when squid are around. This next recording, um, it's gonna be, you might have to turn down your volume. I still have to adjust it, it's a little bit, but I just wanna play you. They're chasing a boat, but these dolphins are very curious and just like we are. And they are communicating, very excited to see this boat. And you can hear rhythms and patterns, and they are 
actually echolocating behind that, but the frequencies are so loud, it's, it's kind of smothered by their communication calls, which are in a lower frequency. Okay, in porpoises. Okay, we only have seven different species of porpoise. They are much smaller than the dolphins. And this is a little harbor porpoise on a boat. You can see how small they are. And at least they are a little bit, and you can see this porpoise, they're about five feet, maybe five and a half feet. So still the vaquita is the smallest of all the porpoises. And um, this porpoise actually faced the same problem that our vaquita have, and that was a gildet victim. So it was caught in a gildet, and we had a really bad time in California with a halibut gillnet fisheries before the sanctuary was developed and they were fishing. They were not only catching lots of harbor porpoise, and, um, but they were catching a lot of sea otters as well. And so we were following them. And actually Tom Jefferson wrote a paper about it. So it's kind of interesting. Um, one of the solutions is that they move the gillnet fisheries away from, our, from their habitat and they weren't catching sea otters anymore and they weren't catching the harbor porpoise. And then finally, once the sanctuaries started, they don't allow gill, gill netting in the sanctuary waters. So porpoises, very different teeth. They have what they call spade shaped teeth and they are basically flattened, but they're not sharp at all. So they don't really know the function of their teeth. But porpoises like well, harbor porpoise feed on mackerel and herring, things like that, so schooling fish. Um, our vaquita actually feed on bottom-dwelling fish, like croakers and grunts and even midshipmen that they'll feed on. And so it's really interesting. So we think they're more like suction feeders. They're not grabbing, grasping prey. They're actually just going down and then Pull, pulling their tongue back, sucking in that food, just like we would use a straw or like a Slurpee gun, okay? Um, so very different, and we're still learning. And this is actually a wonderful video um, Bill Keener took um, right off the Golden Gate Bridge. And we've been able to really learn a lot from that great platform looking at. And this is a mother and calf pair coming up. You'll hear the, the road traffic in the background but um, it's a great platform that they've been using. And then they're gone. And this is, was a very, a lot of disturbance at the surface so you could see them and in fact schools of harbor porpoise are usually singletons solo pairs sometimes we'll see 10 in a group but um there actually have been reported of 200 of them aggregating and feeding on fish so this is what was going on. I know all of you are know about the serious problems we face with ocean pollution. So there's a lot of marine debris and garbage. We have oil spills that are very harmful to our marine mammals and all the marine life out there in the ocean. We have problems right in our cities with storm drains. Everything when we have first flushes or heavy rains that it just power washes the streets and all that dripping oil from cars and litter if people are littering goes directly to the ocean and then the fishing impacts we have problems with right whales right now with with a lot of our crab pots and lines and they're getting caught in those and we don't want to see that they are are in trouble and very endangered. But then we have also gill nets as a real impact and what we're seeing with the vaquita as well. And this is a doll's porpoise in the Japanese fishing fleet, um, salmon fishing, uh, that they were catching a lot of doll porpoise. And we don't know if they're really how they're just not seeing the net. You can see it's green, so it's not really apparent in the water. But 
we if we just think that there's no barriers out there there's a big ocean and then all of a sudden we presented all these barriers and the problem with gill nets is that when it's discarded or the net is broken from a big whale it's just a ghost net out there and it's just all this trash adding to all the marine debris out there in the ocean and i think you've probably heard of the great pacific garbage patches and all of our oceans are showing and it you know it's it's really not a good thing and we've got some bad habits that we have to correct but right now we have out of the 132 species of marine mammals 38 or 29 percent are threatened with extinction right now and we don't want to see that growing in any form or way and um but we have to reduce it and a lot of things we can do at our homes and things like that so the vaquita are very solitary they're usually in pairs and groups sometimes there's a little bit larger groups like they saw recently with the mom and calf pairs that they saw there were i think uh, six or eight of them that they saw in a group um, so this is what we're going to talk about today and the vaquita are is the topic of our talk today and that's why we came here and i'm going to let other people talk about them but we basically need to get rid of the gill nets in their area so i think that's it and that's it for me and good i did go over time Okay, Marcus. Tom, thank you so much for that presentation. That was, uh, it was really cool to see the different species um, and have that biology kind of breakdown that you gave us there. Um, I, I didn't realize that it was, it, it was 29% of those 132 you said are facing right. extinction themselves. Yes. That's, that's too high. <laughs> those species. Yeah, yeah. No, and thank you so much for that. I, I know for anyone joining us and listening, um, we are focusing on vaquita today, as Tom has just said, but all of us probably have a favorite cetacean out there as well. So it's nice to see the, the whole um, collection of them all together like that. So thank you so much, Tom. I really appreciate that. And Tom, yeah, well, thank Tom, you for Tom, letting Tom me Kay, give the presentation. Tom K, can you maybe um, actually you? unshare your screen so you can we can see, see your face at least once? <laughs> oh. There he is. We don't hear you anymore because you're muted now. <laughs> Alrighty. There we go. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There's a. So, anyways, this is all new to me. This virtual programming, but um, you're doing I'm fantastic. Glad we're all here. Yeah. Well, great. Tom, since I have you, and before I let you go, I'm just curious: Do you yourselves have a favorite cetacean, or is there anything specific about vaquita that you particularly admire? Um, I have many favorite cetaceans, because the more you learn about each individual, the more fascinating they become, like any critter that you study. But the the vaquita, Tom got me very involved with the vaquita research in 2008 when we started, when there were many more vaquita, and we were actually photo IDing them, and I'm sure um, that will come up today. But um, And then every other year, we were going down for a month, and, you know, it's just a beautiful area. It's clean. Um, Jacques Cousteau called it the Aquarium of the Sea. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful area. But then we really witnessed the impacts of all the gill nets. And then 2015, I think, was my last season going out with Tom because we were maybe had two or three sightings over a three month period. It's really hard to see them. You need really flat water like Beaufort. This is a Beaufort zero behind me. And you need really flat water. They're very secretive and they come up. They don't splash and leap like dolphins do. And it's really hard to see them. So it takes a lot of patience out there. But the humpback has been my favorite too. I've studied them. Um, I did my master's thesis at Moss Landing with 
Tom Jefferson was there as well. And um, I did the feeding ecology of humpbacks up in the Gulf of the Fairlawns and Cordell Bank Sanctuary. Very cool. So, yeah, so I'm addicted. The more you study <laughs> these animals, the more fascinating they are. And you have little experiences that you can't forget. So I vividly remember swimming with humpbacks in Hawaii because I studied them in Hawaii and Alaska. And, and But yeah, in Hawaii, it was clear water. And swimming with a singer was, was I still dream about that. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. What I was going to say, I appreciate you have that uh, ocean behind you. As you say, that's a Beaufort Zero. We we interviewed a couple of folks about uh, Vaquita who said the same thing as you, that it's just so hard to see them. So that visual of the ocean behind you is really helpful to see that you need the tiniest of ripples to be able right. to see that, that itsy bitsy dorsal fin coming out and, like you say, being able to identify them as quickly as you need to. Right. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. It was very challenging. We had good spotters out there like Paula Olson and Tom Jefferson, and that was very helpful. And then we had a lot of interns helping us that were very young and had great eyesight. <laughs> so yeah, we needed, yeah. When you were out uh, on the sea doing that kind of work, um, how big of a team would you say did you have there? I, I know, like you say, it was a month for a few years there um, where that was happening, but how many people had gotten together to, to make that happen? Like that's a big coordinated effort that you folks pulled together. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. We had at least two to three people um, on the boat. Sometimes we had a little bit more like four or five when we had interns. So it, it really helped having more people looking in all directions to try to find these Vaquita. Um, a lot of times we would look for slicks, frontal ranges, where the water is kind of like forms these streaks, because a lot of times the vaquita would use those streaks to find food. And it was, it was, was, we were learning all the time about what they're doing out there. And it was very fascinating. Those streaks, were those uh, areas of calm or is there something in the water? Like, were you ever able to well, identify? It's like two frontal you know, water bodies coming together and they form these long patterns and a lot of debris, you know, will, will show up on those streaks as well. But that, we we followed those lines too. And sometimes we we're lucky to see Vaquita using the streaks. The picture I took before of the Vaquita, the two Vaquitas, I should have mentioned that. You can see a big slick, they call it. Okay. Behind. Yeah. Oh, that's so yeah. cool. Yeah. But, you know, recording them, too, because we did, I did a lot of hydrophone recordings of grunts, croakers grunting, and they call them grunts, and the croakers actually do croak. You catch a croaker, and it's, and it's just interesting to think about how they're finding their food, because the visibility up in the Gulf of California is, is really poor. And, um, but, yeah, so your mind tends to, like, try to figure out what they're doing all the time in their environment. That must be and, so exciting um, to, to be on the front lines trying to figure out what is happening out here. <laughs> yeah, I was very grateful that Tom invited me and got me involved with the Vaquita. It's just, you know, studying big whales and then going to the smaller. I mean, Doll's porpoise was another favorite porpoise that I was studying, but, but the Vaquita was like, wow, it was very very interesting and very fun to actually get pictures of these little vaquita. But, That's but amazing. Years kept on going on. We didn't have any su success. And I think Tom actually went out in 2016 and with some of the surveys later, but um, I stayed home and helped with the, the website and social media and trying to get the word out about the vaquita. A lot of people don't know what they are. <laughs> that's true. Well, hey, that's why we're here today. This is what we're yeah. doing. We've got uh, your knowledge. Thank you so much for sharing today. Um, everything that you've done, that was really helpful. And uh, I'm excited. We've got some other folks we're going to share here as well. Yeah, yeah. You've got the experts coming up next. Yes. We, oh, hey, everyone here is an expert. This is great. Thank you so right. much, Tom. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. I'll Have a good one. On yeah, you too. <laughs> 
Um, really appreciate Tom's time. Uh, we do have uh, several things planned for you here today. So our next uh, segment, I guess, is going to be with our in-residence uh, artist, artiste. Uh, you have seen a lot of his work uh, on Viva Vaquita, on Porpoise.org. Um, very talented person. I'm very excited to have Julius Satoni. Am I saying that right, Julius? Satoni. Satoni? Satoni. Oh! Like a C-H sound. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, we have Julius here today. He is uh, animating and drawing. He has a lot going on, so we're excited to share that with you. And we're going to be also exploring ways that anyone listening, joining us, watching this live or later can get involved yourself to help us protect uh, Vakita. So I'm going to introduce Julius here. Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, can you all hear me? Through? Okay, excellent. Right on. Well, hello. Uh, my name is Julius Tretini. And uh, I am trained as a biologist uh, in ecology and microbiology, but I'm also an artist. So I'm a scientific illustrator. I produce all kinds of uh, artwork for various researchers, for museums, for coins and stamps and such. And one of the things that I find really dear to my heart and super important is to be involved in conservation. And so uh, that's why I was so happy to be on board here and so grateful to everybody for taking me on as uh, part of the team to be able to share about the Vikita, which is, of course, the world's most endangered cetacean, as uh, Tom was telling us just before. And so anything we can do to make a difference, uh, I think we should. I think, um, for me, I feel it's a responsibility. And in fact, there are things we can do right from wherever we are in the world. We don't have to be there in the Sea of Cortez to be doing it, to be making a difference. That's the beauty of, of what we have now with this really interconnected world uh, digitally, uh, we can make a difference uh, either by letters or by so many other ways. And we're going to talk about that here with Lauren and Marcus uh, about different ways that you personally can get involved and make a difference in saving an entire species. And not just that, but also the many other species that it shares its environment with and all those around us everywhere. Because all the things we're doing here, we can apply it to everything else as well that's living on Earth. Okay? So what I'm going to do here to make this kind of fun, uh, we're going to switch back and forth uh, to some artwork that I'm going to be working on today. Uh, and uh, this artwork features uh, the Vaquita, of course. And uh, I'm going to be preparing a digital painting this time. So last two times we did sort of a live traditional drawing or an acrylic painting. So that was a lot of fun. This time I brought my other uh, side of my studio and we're going to be doing a digital painting of Vaquita in full color. So it should be kind of fun that way. And if you want to follow along, uh, that's great. You can also use this to view it afterwards if we record it. Um, uh, as an example of how I do this and uh, gives you sort of like a, a, a view of what it's like to be uh, a digital artist this way as well. So it's very similar actually to working on things like acrylic, but this way I get to do it right in the computer. So I guess um, uh, Marcus will control the the c cameras and stuff and whatever you want to switch back and forth between the um, the painting and uh, you know a screenshot of my face or whatever but I think most people will be interested in the painting especially <laughs> so okay so what I've got here is you can see I have this this sort of studio set up where I have uh, this is an interactive LCD display um, and I can use a stylus uh, to paint right on the screen and then I've got a little remote that I can use to zoom in and out as well so for example if I want to look closer I can do that or zoom out um, it's really a handy little device and I use this for my work in general. Now to, uh, you've already seen some wonderful photos of the Vaquita and other porpoises from Tom. Uh, here's one that I have painted for the Porpoise Conservation Society. So this is an example of uh, Vaquita artwork that I've done. Uh, it gives you sort of an idea of what this looks like in ways that we generally do not are not able to see it when when those of us who are able who are lucky enough to be out in the field to see it are able to see it because most of the time all you see is the, <laughs> the fin maybe right uh, from above the water and as Tom was saying they're very secretive they tend not to show themselves too much they don't leap from the water so what we're seeing here is what you would be able to see if you were so lucky that you were underwater when they passed by basically and they have several really neat little features uh, porpoises are really fascinating because, and here's a, a view of all, certainly, currently all known uh, species of porpoise on Earth, uh, all to scale, basically. The vaquita is the smallest. It's a little tiny one. It's 
barely, it's about the size of your two outstretched arms, really tiny for cetacean. Uh, the other ones uh, are, occur in different parts of the world. So this one has the most restricted range. And if you live near the ocean, chances are you'll be able to potentially see some sort of porpoise uh, in various parts of the world. But today we're focusing mostly on, on the vaquita. Um, the neat thing about porpoises, I just go back to that artwork as well there, uh, is that you can see, if you look at the dorsal fin, the, the fin on the back, whether it's present or not, there's a finless one, they're very different from each other. That's something that, that is really useful in identifying porpoises. You can see that they vary from no dorsal fin uh, to a, uh, a kind of a swept back one in Burmeisters, a uh, very sort of a, a low triangular one like in our harbor porpoise here, to really weird, long, plate-like one like in the spectacled porpoise in the male. And the vaquita, oh, it's a, the Dallas porpoise has a weird um, forward swept one in, in, in uh, larger, uh, especially the male individuals. And the vaquita is the one that has the most dolphin-like fin. And so Lauren was going, uh, was explaining how the podcast that uh, the PCS runs, the uh, Porpoise Conservation Society runs, the Not a Dolphin, uh, the, the vaquita sort of ironically is the most dolphin looking of the porpoises <laughs> i guess you could say if you don't look at its snout the the it doesn't have a long rostrum like most dolphins do some more have short ones like this but its dorsal fin for example is very dolphin like so anyway sort of an overview of the various porpoises there and this is the the vaquita porpoise that we're going to be uh dealing with today and i'm going to be painting a picture of a vaquita porpoise uh in its environment so i've kind of started out a little bit with painting uh some of the background now, if you want to do this, one of the things to keep in mind is when you're doing nice backgrounds, you want to make it sort of like lively and, 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 and diverse. So you don't want to make it too uniform. Have fun with, uh, you know, throwing paint around and such and changing colors and such. For me, when I'm doing this, I can change colors by selecting different colors in my color picker here. Uh, I can also use a color picker to select an existing color from there. So what you see here is mostly what I've set up in the background. I always usually do that. I kind of give a, a, a background color first, and then I can start on the actual subject. And the subject in this case will be our cute little panda of the sea, the vaquita. So what I'm gonna do is, for me, I get to set up a new layer. This is something where it's kind of nice to have digital artwork um, because I can set up an entire new, new layer uh, called vaquita. And that way I can separate the work on that layer uh, oops, from the previous layers. So I'm just gonna set up a new one. Here we go. That's so cool. And this way, if I make an error on it, I want to change it. I only have to change that one layer. All it's like all the paint underneath it has dried, and I'm working on a whole new layer of like cellophane or whatever. Um, although not cellophane, we don't like cellophane. It's it's plastic, and we we don't want to use disposable single-use cellophane if we can avoid it. Right? There are good alternatives to that because that's one of the things that's uh, um, cramming up the oceans, and that a lot of animals like sea turtles will mistake it for jellyfish and choke on it, unfortunately. So yeah, uh, let's say just a kind of a film. And so now I'm working on a whole other layer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start painting a vaquita. Now vaquita are neat little guys to paint here. I'm going to use my other artwork here is kind of oops, not that one it's kind of a little bit of a, a mini guide um just because you know it's as a scientific illustrator it's important for me to get the anatomy right so i've used photographs of them to get this right and this piece that i've done here is one that i've painstakingly taken care to make sure that all of it is right you'll see certain features like it has that that cute little uh ring around its eye that dark spot there. This is one of the reasons why it's it's referred to sort of colloquially as the panda of the sea. It kind of has this little eye spot. It's really adorable. They've also got this little dark area around the mouth. And then there's these little lines coming from the back of the mouth or under the mouth to the pectoral fins or the flippers, these two, which are equivalent to our arms. And then of course, there's a little bit of a, a grayish wash and there's a darker back. And so the, the eye, the dark eye with the lighter ring around it is kind of very characteristic of the vaquita specifically. And that's something that, um, that is really easy to identify them from. Uh, so what I'm gonna do to make things interesting, this vaquita that I'm painting here, I'm just gonna adjust the brush a little bit, um, is going to be sort of kind of swimming a little bit toward us uh, and it's passing close by us. So imagine we're underwater and we're just hanging out there in the Sea of Cortez and all of a sudden this beautiful little 
<laughs> Fish-sized, like Tatuaba-sized animal swims past us. And of course, that's why they're in such great danger is that the, the gill nets that are designed to catch the Tatuaba fish um, for, that, they're, that are poached for the swim bladders, uh, the do- they, they are designed to catch something about the same size as a vaquita. And so, of course, the vaquita is also likely to get entangled in those same nets. So I'm going to start painting here. You can see uh, I'm setting up sort of basically a, a block of color, roughly the shape of a, of a vaquita, and then I'll, I'll refine it as I go. This is going to be sort of like the front end, the head of the animal. And then toward the back here, what you're going to see is that as it's swimming close to us, that part is going to be a little bit larger than the back part because what we have is we're dealing with perspective. And it's also, so anything that's closer to you appears a little bit larger than it, proportionally to the rest of it than, than it is if, it's looking, if you're looking at it from the side. Also, the animal looks a little squat and shorter because of this thing called foreshortening, which right, means that if you look at something edge on, um, you don't, it doesn't seem, it seems to shrink in size because of course it, yeah, it, it, most of it is, is going into the page in this case. So here's our general large first block that defines where the vaquita is going to be on the page. And then I'm going to start to add larger pieces to it like the dorsal fin. This doesn't have to be like perfect right away. And this, if you're doing this by painting, let's say with acrylic paints, those are fun to work with because they dry quickly. You can, you can paint over them easily. You know, they're very amenable to changes, to, to uh, fixing and such. But one thing I've learned as an artist working with acrylic paints, which as you know, are kind of plastic based. And right today, the, the big message is about trying to find ways to avoid uh, harming marine life using, you know, by our footprint in various ways. And one of the ways we do, we harm them, unfortunately, is by throwing away single use plastics uh, like bags and such. And so uh, acrylic paint is kind of plastic based, right? So if you wash out your brush and then you rinse that washings down the sink, you've generated a bunch of little like microplastic pieces, which are really nasty. So what I do instead of, if I'm using acrylic paints, is I will collect all of the brush washings in a larger container, uh, instead of throwing it down the sink and I just let it dry out. Just set it on the counter in the sun or wherever and just dries out over time. And then all that happens is that acrylic forms layer on the bottom of that container. And I just keep using that container over and over and over again to put more washings in it and dry it out. And all that happens is you collect all of that waste in one place instead of washing it down. Anyway, that's something that I found as an artist that is is maybe a, a more sustainable way to use uh, an otherwise sort of plastic based paint that you can do that as well. So you can see now here that the vaquita is sort of taking shape. I've been adding a little bit of darkness to it. And now we're heading toward the back here toward the flippers or sorry, the flukes, the flukes and all these names for the different parts of animals. So with cetaceans, with uh, marine mammals that, um, that are related to whales, uh, they have the, they have fins that are, that have evolved completely independently of those of fish in some cases, the dorsal fin and the flukes in the back have evolved completely independently. Uh, the flippers, the two in the front there, are what we call homologous to the front pectoral fins of fish. In other words, they have the same genetic origin. They, they, they both uh, are the same, the same structure that is our arms and the pectoral fin of fish. And in cetaceans, whales and dolphins and porpoises, they evolved back into flippers, into fin-like structures. Uh, but the flukes in the back here, these little, the tail fin and the dorsal fin evolved completely brand new after the ancestor of cetaceans entered the water. And these have evolved uh, because they make the animal much more able to swim through the water more efficiently uh, to control itself underwater um, and use less energy as a result. So there are the flukes in the back. And so this vaquita you can see is kind of coming toward us again. So you get the foreshortening, the flukes are kind of pointing downward. So it's kind of in the middle of a, a stroke, of a beating a stroke with its tail. And then of course you have the flippers in the front. Now those are close to the front here. So they're gonna be a little bit larger proportionally than we have in the drawing that is sort of as a guide. 
coming out of the side a little bit. And because this Vaquita is kind of facing us, we're going to see both of those flippers, uh, one on each side of the animal. So I kind of have to imagine where the other one would come out. So I kind of, what I do is I draw an imaginary sort of cross-sectional shape for the Vaquita, kind of oval, right at the point where the the flipper connects on our side. And then where that meets on the other side is where I would normally start the other flipper. And it comes out like this kind of, it's kind of a little shortcut to figuring out where to put your fins on an animal. Uh, if you're looking at it and you can't see the origin of the fin on the other side, it kind of helps you to kind of do it sort of in an imaginary way or in your head, so to speak. So here we go. They've got parts of the Vaquita. And of course, the nice thing is this stylus also has a built-in eraser function on the back. So again, different from, from acrylic paint. I can't just erase acrylic paint easily. You can pull it off with water if you do it fast enough. But I, I've got a shortcut here with, with this digital artwork. So that makes it a whole lot nicer. Now, Julius, is that a bit easier for you to make any uh, corrections because you have those layers, like you said? You've Absolutely. kept the base separate from what you're currently doing? For sure. So I can just turn this off if I want. It's still there. It's just turned off now and then I can turn it back on. If I want to see what's behind it, if I want to work on the background and just switch layers and do that. Uh, when I erase here, I'm just erasing the one layer. So it doesn't do anything to the, the background. So if I, I can erase out a chunk like that, you can still <gasps> see the background. That's okay because I also have a, a, a back step function. <laughs> so I can just, and that's one other undo. thing we can't do undo with, with traditional artwork. Just, I, and the funny thing is, and a lot of artists will, will agree with me on this, is that when we switch to, to traditional artwork, like uh, drawing with a pencil or with acrylic paint, I have this, um, this desire sometimes to hit undo when I've made a mistake and then I realize, Oh, wait, I'm not doing this digitally. I can't undo. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you do those kind of things. And yes, I have almost uh, put my stylus into uh, a, a, a mug of coffee. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> I didn't, but it was close. Uh, and yes, I have dipped my traditional brush into my coffee because I accidentally <laughs> mistook it for the washing water. So yeah, a lot of artists will have these kind of stories. Uh, we get so focused on what we're doing. <laughs> totally, totally. So one of the things that I want to kind of switch to while I'm doing this, and Lauren and Marcus, we can chat about this, is what can you do to make a difference for the vaquita? And this is, I think it's kind of a fun time to talk about it as I do this. So you can watch as I paint, but we can also talk about the things that we do that can make a difference. Now, we're talking about this now, especially, or at least in, in the, now as well in this segment, because artwork is such a useful um, tool for advocating for conservation. I've been able to apply it to so many in so many ways. Uh, one popular way is um, you've seen us do a version of this before as well on, on the International Save the Vaquita Day. It's kind of a drawing workshop where you can tune in and, and learn how to draw. Basically doing the same thing here. It's just that right now I'm giving less direct um, instruction on the drawing, less kind of a step-by-step -step sort of thing. But I do that for several different organizations online. And then we kind of teach kids and adults about these fascinating and endangered species and also teach them the fun thing of how to draw them at the same time. So that's one way. Another way, and this is one that you'll be able to use over and over again and that is really pertinent today, is that you can create these drawings and then send them in emails or physical letters, maybe even better, to those government representatives, uh, either locally in your area or to, in this case, for example, the Mexican government or the Canadian federal government or the U.S. federal government, uh, key people there that are going to be important in making decisions or influencing others in, in meetings internationally to make policy decisions that will help the Vaquita. So making stronger laws to prevent poaching, for example. That's a big one. That's what we need the Mexican government to do, especially, and to enforce those. So, for example, you could write a letter to somebody at the Mexican embassy, for example, in your city, um, or, or even visit them uh, and encourage them to make, you know, to, to have the right kind of influence, to, to encourage the Mexican government to make these kinds of changes. But one of the things we can do, regardless of whether we're able to move around or not, is we can send letters. And so one of the things that I found to be a kind of a neat thing to consider is to send a picture with your letter. 
And, um, you know, you can maybe draw a little sketch even on your envelope, but especially inside because it's going to be harder for them to just kind of toss it away if there's this really nice little picture that they get to keep as well. And I think it's going to make a stronger impression of, on them if there's also some uh, a, a beautiful picture that you've taken time to create to show your appreciation and concern for these animals and to show what you love about them. Um, put your heart into it, you know, make a, make a beautiful colored picture or, or a beautiful drawing, whichever. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you don't have a lot of skill or experience with it. The point of this is that it, your love for it will show through. Anybody will, will be able to see that anyway. So put your heart into it. Use your artwork to help advocate to save a species. And this is an, actually an opportunity for us to do this because as, as others have said, the Vikita is actually, even though there are only, like Tom was saying, maybe 10 of them around, it sounds impossible. But it's, it, it appears from research that even these small numbers, they're able to recover from these small numbers if they're given a chance and they don't have to encounter these nets that can kill them. So yes, we can make a difference. It is not too late. It is a reasonable thing to do. The other thing to consider is that regardless, we want to take a stand and we want to keep telling uh, government representatives that we stand up against poaching, period. We want these kinds of poaching cartels, especially these organized ones, to stop. And regardless of how well the vaquita does, we want to make sure we protect everything all life in the Sea of Cortez and elsewhere that is now unfortunately very subject to poaching. And so we should be doing this anyway, whether we, how, whatever we think of in terms of how likely it is that the Vikiti will survive. I really hope they will. I do. I'm realistic. I know that there's a chance that we might lose the battle, but I don't want to focus on that. What I want to focus on is, you know what? I'm going to take the stand. We want to say this far, no further. We stand up against poaching. The way to do that effectively is to reach those people who make the laws and enforce them. Because individually, you know, we can't go out there and, and physically stop them, but we can empower people who do have the means to do that. Um, and this is what we need to do. So here we go. We've got the Vikita kind of coming along here. Um, and anyway, yeah, you guys just please interject anytime. <laughs> I know I tend to ramble, but please do. I, I do not mind being cut off, but I have this tendency to ramble. <laughs> Hey, you know, I'm the same. I, I, everything you're saying is, is on point with what I'm thinking as well. And, you know, you were mentioning about, and we've talked about this in the podcast and, and anyone watching, I know there's about 200 people uh, watching right now from, from all over. Um, we know that that poaching as, as Julia just mentioned is a huge uh, concern. And I also think it's important for us to remember that the reason there's poaching out there is there's demand. Right. right. And I remember having a conversation with someone years ago about, you know, consuming a species that was highly endangered. And the conversation kind of went to, well, I'm going to eat it as long as I can. And I don't know if I said that last year as well. It's it the just, you know, <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's one of those things where some of us, you know, might have that mindset and others don't. Um, so I think, you know, for us, as people who care and are concerned about this species, and again, as, as Julius mentioned, it's not just this species, it's a lot. Um, sometimes even those little conversations, maybe you're out with someone who yes. is talking about how uh, they can't wait to try Totoaba, maybe they're going on vacation or whatever. Um, and then having that awkward conversation of saying like, oh, you know, that's a really endangered species and there's, there's a lot of problems. We have so much power to affect change in so many ways. Julius is giving us a list of, of, you know, using art and writing letters a hundred percent. That's incredibly effective, but I'm actually curious. I wanted to kind of turn it on our, on our viewers, anyone who's currently watching, uh, or if you're watching this at a later time, um, what have you done? What kind of ways have you tried to affect change? Maybe you were asking someone at the grocery store, if that was a sustainable seafood, maybe you, um, created a program at your school. Uh, we had a bunch of students at the school yeah. I was working at and they, they recreated the recycling program at the high school and the power of these students was, was unbelievable. That's so wonderful. I'm curious about any of our viewers, what kind of things have you done to affect a change? Maybe there's something you've done to help Vakita specifically. Um, 
maybe there's something that you've done to protect, uh, you know, old growth forests or protecting the oceans or you're involved with an organization that's taking plastic out of the sea, whatever it is. I'm kind of curious um, what what else is out there because, you you know, it's, a, it's an unbelievably complex list of things that we can do. And I think when you have such a big list of things that you can do, Julius and I were talking about this earlier, that it does feel like there's not much that we can do, but the list of what we can do is so huge that we have, Absolutely. we do have the power. Absolutely. So we'll keep an eye on those questions. And that's the thing. It's a very good point, Lauren, is that not just, it's not just about, you know, sending letters to government representatives, but yeah, let's reach out to our friends. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and, and as you're saying, uh, yes, it's very easy for us to feel overwhelmed and discouraged and, and to feel despair that well, what we, what we're doing isn't, is a, is less than a drop in the bucket. But, Remember that individuals who are motivated can make a big difference. Uh, yep. I mean, I always think back uh, as, as one extreme example, but very true. Uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, just a few years ago, uh, started something that is massive now. And it's one person. Yep. Uh, but that, that you don't even need one person who's made that big a difference. You need to make just a tiny difference. If you influence your friends, just let them know about this. As, as Tom was saying, and as, as Marcus and, and Lauren were saying, very few people actually even know what a vaquita is. We need to know that before we can make uh, enough of a difference to help them in many cases. So just spread the word, uh, find ways, organize, yes, with your school, uh, you know, workshops or, or meetings or clubs to uh, help um, wildlife in your area or, or remotely with the vaquita. So many wonderful things you can do either with using artwork or without um, you know, go make signs and stand in front of, you know, like your local government representative place to say, you know, signs that say that you love the vaquita, that you want them preserved, and here's what you can do. Contact people like that. Um, the key is we want to do things in, a, in a, a peaceful way, but there's so many things we can do this way. So many ways to get involved. Uh, you can organize, you know, with your with groups. You can, you can um, I think few people know this, well, maybe a lot of people know this, but not everybody does, that you can organize, depending on where you are, meetings, either in person or, or virtually now, meetings with your uh, government representatives uh, in your constituency to talk about certain topics that you're concerned about. And it's, that's what they're there to do, to hear you. That's why you have local representatives, is they need to hear what their constituents want. And they don't know what they want, what we want unless we tell them. So. Uh, I encourage you, and we're going to put together a package. Um, I, uh, I like it. They, they, they don't know what we want. Yeah. Right? Exactly. That's it. And, and, and we need to tell them this. Because, and we found this out as well, meeting with, with our local representative several times. Uh, he was unaware of some of the problems that we had brought up. And it's, we are educating them. They, it's super important because a lot of them will, sh will shift between different ministries. And so they have to learn a lot. They're not going to learn a lot of this stuff automatically. We need to tell them repeatedly sometimes. And so when we do that, they are now aware of the issue and can start acting on it. Um, so look up and we're going to put together a little package uh, on how to find out, you know, who your local representatives are to meet with, for example. And then you can, and there are going to be little there's, uh, links also to great websites that help you to prepare for meetings. So what you can, you know, how you how it's best to approach them, what's best in terms of length of time or what to say that's most effective, things like that, uh, either in letters or meeting in person. Uh, and these are all super effective. And, and I have found with several of our groups that this is, in fact, quite effective locally here. And um, we can affect things over a much greater range nowadays, too. And the more people you get together in these meetings, the more impactful the meetings will be on those people. So that's uh, government. There's also potential for meeting with industry. Um, and we're seeing some of that here and there as well. So whatever opportunity you have to encourage people who make decisions or who, you know, who um, are involved in industries that, that affect wildlife, such as the vaquita, please do. You may naturally feel uh, apprehensive at first or nervous meeting with them. I did it at first too. But you know what? It, it takes very little time to get over that. And you'll see that they're actually very courteous when you meet with them typically. Uh, it's their job to be respectful and responsive to people. Uh, and so you're going to find that it, it's a lot better experience than you 
you fear it is. Uh, and it, it, it's super fun once you get to the point where you see that, you know, you, oh, I, I just let them know about something they didn't know about. And, and, and that maybe now they can, they can take this a step further and actually make big change in policy as well. So anyway, that's, so I go back here to, to the policy making because really that's a very big important thing for the Vaquita today. No, but, for sure. And I, I think you made a really interesting point of, you know, they don't know unless you tell them. And I think no matter what in anyone's life, I think we all probably have experienced this where you, you get really, you know, down the rabbit hole on, on something. Mm -hmm. And in your head, you're like, surely everyone knows this. But when you start having conversations, you realize not as many people know about this thing as you expect that they would. Um, so just even having that respectful conversation or, or asking that question in the first place is a good way to kind of just get a sense of where people are at. And, and it's not often that people are trying to be purposefully, um, like not understanding something like they're purposely trying to ignore something like they, people have a lot of stuff going on in yeah. their lives. Like these last couple of years have been a little intense for everyone. Oh, just, a little bit. just a little bit. Oh wow. And everyone's, yes. everyone's got stuff going on. Not everyone knows everything, so we can be a bit more um, gentle when we when we have those conversations and bring people along with us. It's yeah. a lot easier to um, get people involved when we are a bit more gentle instead of yes. <laughs> attacking them with our you know our frustrations. So, I I, I agree with you, Julius. Like having those um, letter campaigns, like they are effective. They they, they absolutely are. make a difference. So 100%. Write your ideas down draw your art, share that. And, and this is something that's accessible to everyone and anyone. Um, we want to make sure as many people and can be a part of this. It doesn't need to be perfect. Like, yeah, um, exactly. I'm Marcus, by the way, the voice in, in, the, in the distance. <laughs> I'm the only one who doesn't have a camera here. But uh, <laughs> everyone who's been watching Julius and has been thinking like, oh my God, I'm never, never going to pull off anything like this to, to include in my letter to the Mexican government. Well... Uh, I assure you the Mexican president probably can't paint better than you. So <laughs> just give it a go. I Absolutely. make, I make mean stick poppers. <laughs> yeah. And that's, the th <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I want to see that. <laughs> yes, exactly. Actually, one of the neat things would be, I don't know, um, if we've set up anything, but it'd be really neat to see people's artwork as well. If, if, if there was a way for us to have people submit it and make even a little gallery or something for the event, yeah. I know that'd be really cool. Uh, we'll have to think about how to do that. But, but we've done that with several of our, several of the how to draw sessions I've done with various organizations. Uh, and it's really neat to see people's artwork submitted and then you can kind of look through it and see what other people have done as a result of this. I think it would be really cool for us to see your artwork if you're, if you're willing to send it. Um, your your, it, your yeah. stick vaquita are most welcome. Um, Absolutely. You can share it Absolutely. with, with hashtag um, save the vaquita. Just one word, save the vaquita. Uh, we're going to be monitoring this on Instagram. So if you're on Instagram, and I hope you are for this purpose, uh, please show your artwork. And uh, love to see it. Tell you what, I'll draw something on my phone. That's all I have. I'm going to draw. Cool. I'll, I'll attempt <laughs> to draw a stick porpoise, and I will post it. And you know, that's the other thing, that there are many free um, software packages for phones and iPads and various things like that that mm -hmm. allow you to draw with your finger even, or you know, even if you don't have a stylus. And you can just do quick, easy digital artwork that way. Um, a lot of people haven't tried this before, but there are some things out there that you can get. And it's a lot of fun to do that as well, um, especially if you just kind of wanted to do a sketch. A um, great way to do it digitally. But yeah, I mean, the other way, of course, is traditionally pick up a pen and paper. Um, right now, the, I've got this set up as an eight and a half by 11 inch um, page here. I usually do that for my drawing webinars anyway, because a lot of people have letter size paper available. Uh, unless, of course, you're, you know, overseas and then you have a different system in many cases. Uh, and I was just thinking, Julius, maybe we should. Um, I'm not sure if you're willing to do this because mm -hmm. uh, Julius is an award winning artist um, <laughs> with a PhD in microbiology. Um, probably the smartest person in the room here right now. No. <laughs> At least I always feel that way when I'm with Julius. Uh, but Julius, are you going to make this available oh, for yeah. people to download? Oh, sure, um, maybe sure, they can sure, just sure, sure. print it and put yeah. that into their letters. That's if, the other thing. I mean, it's better if you do your own, I think, because I think the point of it is to personalize it. But um, but absolutely, you can use it for if you wanted it to, you know, to to share it online or whatever and messages, posts or whatever. Please feel free. Um, and uh, absolutely, I'll make it available. So we'll we'll have a package of various kinds of things afterwards as well, like, you know, how to reach 
uh, how to write letters and such, or you know, web, uh, websites that show you uh, maybe how to find your representatives or whatever. Um, and um, and this will include as well as like the the image, the completed image or the close to completed image <laughs> sort of thing. This is kind of like a painting sketch, by the way. This is kind of um, it's how I would kind of begin a lot of my pieces anyway. Uh, if I were doing this for a, a client, for let's say a research publication, it would take a lot longer to finish it up. And this is very, very rough at this stage. But um, compared to what I would do for those kinds of um, uh, purposes, <laughs> this purpose, this purpose. <laughs> but uh, uh. sorry, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but this is how it begins basically. Um, and uh, and as we go, actually, as I'll. I'll mention a couple of other neat things about this this process here is that uh, one of the things we can do uh, is when we when we create oops, when we create these these artworks uh, of, of organisms underwater these these wonderful life forms underwater um, if it's near the surface and if the water is fairly clear then you get these wonderful patterns on their backs um, called caustics. Uh, caustics are a result of sunlight passing from the air into the water and then being refracted by the, uh, by the water. And the light is basically bent in different directions as a result of passing through this, um, this interface between two different media. And as a result, it's focused in different ways. And then some places you have a highly focused beam of, of sunlight appearing and then very darker areas in between. The end result, and I'll make a new layer for this actually. There's so much technique that, oh, I, right. that, I, I, can't, that I can't reproduce with my stick bucket. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's amazing how quickly uh, one can learn this. It's super fast. Uh, if, if you put a little of effort into it and, um, and you know, get the right kind of instruction, it, it, people can pick this up incredibly fast. It's amazing, really. But what we're going to do here is uh, I'll show you what the caustics kind of look like when I paint them on. A couple of couple of tips if you're doing underwater artwork. Uh, not painting underwater. I mean, maybe you could do that too, which would be fun if you had the right media. But painting pictures of scenes from underwater. Uh, the caustics would work something like this. I'm going to select a brighter, higher, uh, brighter thing. So now we're on a different layer here again. So if I erase the caustics, I want to erase my vaquita. The caustics appear as... Now, they, they are controlled by the, the direction of waves, right? Waves change the angle of the surface of the water and therefore the way that the sunlight is bent when it enters. And you get areas where it's focused and areas where it's not. And the end result is you get this network pattern, this bending network pattern of bright lines on the back of the porpoise. And uh, they intersect with each other. And when they intersect, they get brighter because it's basically light adding to light which makes it brighter in those places where they intersect uh basically a series of lines and twisty lines and such and then and then you got to remember that this is on the curved back of an animal okay so the light is coming almost straight down so that the sides of the animal will not get those caustics but as we near the side the caustics get stretched out because it's now hitting an angle and you're seeing it in a very different way. So as you go toward the sides of the animal, these caustic lines will get dimmer, but more stretched out vertically. So this is natural. So you can't just paint them the same network way all around. You want to do it accurately. You make them sharpest on top and then more stretched out and fading on the sides. And on the sides, they end with basically a series of these kind of vertical lines as the caustics kind of bleed off into sort of an infinity of the deep. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way to do caustics and then again you have these brighter points where they intersect because again basically a bunch of lines that are focused sunlight um, by the waves above and if there's no wave movement at all if it's completely calm you won't get these caustics right because there's there's no focusing happening there's no uh, differential distribution of sunlight it's all beautifully smoothly passing down all you'll have is a bright upper surface to the vaquita if it's really, really wavy, then you also often don't get caustics because now there's so much movement and so many different directions the light is passing that everything gets kind of muddled together. You don't get these beautiful, sharp caustics. It's only in intermediately disturbed water, um, slight waves that you get these brightest, sharpest caustics. 
Um, and we're pretending that's the case now. It's like one of those beautiful Beaufort, um, is it Beaufort one. Yeah. Seas that Tom was describing that, that are best for, whoops, for seeing Vaquita. Uh, so we're showing well, Bofort, a Vaquita. Beaufort zero. Oh, sorry. Beaufort zero. Best, right, but... right. That's the calm. Uh, or very close to it anyway. Very close Bo to it. Beaufort one is just a few ripples. So maybe like that. Yeah. So we're close to the time, you know, close to conditions that would be optimal for seeing Vaquita on the surface. Uh, a little bit more waves. You really don't need much waves to set up caustics. Just a tiny, tiny bit. So probably close to Beaufort zero. Uh, and then here, when you get to the dorsal fin, remember that they're narrow, right? It's like a, it's like I'm holding my hand, basically, like that. So you only get caustics show up clearly if the if the porpoise is is vertically oriented in the water, so that the dorsal fin is vertical. You only get caustics show up really brightly on the edge, on the leading edge of it, right? Uh, and then the lines come down the side very sharply because uh, that's like the side of the animal, the way it's oriented. So. And you can even, you know, like erase out parts of it. I'm going to change my eraser to make it less opaque so I can erase out part of it. This is, again, kind of fun because it's like erasing lightly, right? If it was a real eraser. Um, and so we get little caustics here and there. And, and keep in mind, you don't want to make them too regular either. It's one of the things that it's very hard to master an artist to, to make things look natural. You need sort of a... Uh, less regularity than you might feel is 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 required. Uh, you don't have like the, the waves on the surface aren't a perfect geometric pattern of of squares, for example, right? Or or, or single lines. So rarely do you get such simple looking waves like this, just a single line of waves and nothing else. Usually they're all over the place, and so you the caustics reflect this. Um, no pun intended. In this case, refracted, I guess, would be accurate that way. But uh, the they reflect it in the sense that that they're also sort of helter skelter all over the place, and they move <laughs> fast. And so you're trying to capture a moment in this dynamic play, this dance of light on the back of an animal. Uh, and so, you know, whatever you know, there's a lot of right answers to how this looks. There are only a few rules to keep in mind, like the brighter areas where they overlap, like those those sort of the the, the blurring the the uh, the dimming that happens and the stretching that happens on the sides, those are all help guide you. But the actual patterns themselves, you can be really creative with it. Uh, and because you, you know, you look at a photograph or a series of photographs or stills of video, you can see all kinds of things happening with these caustics. Some of them are actually thicker. Some develop a little bit wider uh, or you'll have two of them close together and they partially merge. So you get these brighter areas between them. That's fine too. You just got to be creative. I love to try to figure out how light works in the water. Um, it is a fun thing, and that's how you get familiar with how these things work, and that's how you can create the most accurate imagery. Just try to understand optics, and it's it's really neat. Um, so, and and sure, it's just trying to understand the physics yeah. of this. Um, you, you would only see these caustic uh, lines if the animal were close enough yes. to the surface, Good right? Point. You don't see this yes. if they're like a hundred meters underwater. Right, and that's the uh, the other reason for that is because yeah, they're basically light is being focused on the surface but if you go below you remember how when you use a magnifying glass to focus sunlight you'll get a point at a certain distance from the magnifying glass where the sun is is focused and then you go below that and it blurs out again because it's no longer in focus the same way with the waves the waves are just lenses and so they focus sunlight at a particular distance below that it becomes blurred out and all you see first is the caustics being just wide swaths of light of color and just being less uh, conspicuous and more obscure. And then the further down you go, the less light there is and the less focused they are even still. And before long at all, all you get is just a uniformly brighter surface on top. Uh, you'll see, actually speaking of that, you'll see that the vaquita is lighter underneath than on top. It's, it's an actual coloration aside from, from the, the shadows. And that is what we call counter shading. Uh, it means that the br the undersurface of the animal is brighter, and the 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 evolutionary purpose of this, the the, the way it functions, is that shadows the, the animal shades itself right when light hits it from above, and that makes it would make it more visible to predators. The counter shading cancels out some of those shadows that it casts on itself, and it basically makes the animal vanish into the background of the ocean, so it can evade predators. Uh, or sneak up on prey. So this is a wonderful example of an animal that displays this really neat uh, feature that is found all over the animal kingdom, this counter shading. It's very effective both on land 
and in the water, and you see so many animals with lighter bellies, and this is the primary reason that that exists. There is selection pressure. Uh, they survive better, they escape predation better, when they can hide better. It makes sense, right? And, 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 and like you mentioned uh, that uh, they like to sneak up on prey too because they are very adorable. They're such <laughs> cute animals, but they're actually yes. really mean predators yes, if they need they to are. be. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They are. They're, that's true. And if, you, if it opened its mouth, you could see a vaquita's teeth. Um, like the uh, porpoises have more spoon-shaped teeth than, uh, than uh, dolphins, for example. They but don't look like a predator's teeth. They don't look. Yeah, exactly. But they're still effective at catching fish. And, uh, and, and so they function as they are needed to function. They work well in the environment in which they are and for the prey that they need. Um, and uh, so they are predators. They do need to hunt. It's just that they happen to be so adorable um, <laughs> with this little panda-like spot and stuff. I'm putting the eye in now. The eye also of cetaceans is beautiful. I love, I love their eyes. They always have this sort of peaceful look. Uh, even you know when they're out killing fish, uh, <laughs> they still have these beautiful little peaceful eyes, um, and uh, I, I just uh, I remember this one the one time that I had this beautiful experience in Hawaii actually when a a spinner dolphin um, I was underwater uh, snorkeling and um, just checking out the coral reef in this beautiful bay area and. The spinner dolphin came and swam by to check me out. And, oh my god! To see to see a marine mammal approach you and just swim by you curiously—it's just—it's—it's it's just a spectacular experience. Um, you can't really describe how beautiful it is that a wild animal comes to check you out. And I am always amazed at how peaceful they are and gentle with humans. All cetaceans, basically. Um, orcas, the top predators of the ocean, basically. Sperm whales as well. Uh, they are so amazingly peaceful and gentle with us. It's, it, 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 it's, uh, it seems statistically unlikely that, if, that it was just by accident. They're, they seem to be avoiding harming us. And I, I think that's just a beautiful example of how large animals that are capable of so much uh, danger or damage choose not to for us. And let's be the same way. Let's, let's choose to look out for them to care for them, to really be concerned about them, just because they are, uh -huh. not because they I... serve any purpose for us. Just let's respect them, let's love them, and show them that we care by doing what we can to protect them. I love the sentiment that they are so gentle and they don't harm us, so we shouldn't harm them. I mean, you know, let's not approach them to harass them, because that's important too, right? Because <laughs> a lot of people will, and unfortunately we did see that's that in right. Hawaii as well. We saw some people chasing dolphins, and that's yeah. illegal for one thing. But um, but it's also harmful and it's 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 good that's illegal because they need they need to be able to get away and have peace uh, from you know people harassing them. Same thing with sharks. We have a lot of people that kind of try to approach sharks and sharks are a lot more gentle than most people realize. But we also don't want to harass them for their good as well as for safety. Um, and you know we leave them alone and then we have these wonderful experiences with them. They will often come and check us out. Uh, both dolphins and porpoises, and in, in the case in, I had in Caledon New Caledonia a couple of years ago, sharks as well, they came and checked me out. Beautiful, beautiful, wonderful experiences. Uh, and with the vaquita, we need to give them their space, but um, we can do things to protect them from out of the water. So I would really encourage us all to let's be compassionate and empathetic at our core. And let's use that as a yardstick, uh, as a standard of how to live in everything that we do. Uh, whether, you know, we choose, okay, well, I'm going to, I don't have to buy this particular product, even though I would really enjoy its taste or whatever. But let's say I have a choice between two versions of it. One that's, for example, wrapped in plastic, another one that is not. Uh, because, you know, that plastic may be recycled, maybe not, but it, it is a threat to marine wildlife especially. Um, so I'll choose the one that, that is better for them, even if it costs the same or is equally convenient for me, even if it's more convenient for me to buy the one that's less responsibly wrapped or, or sourced or that tastes good but comes from a source that maybe is um, removing animals in, a, in an unsustainable way from the environment. I choose not to get those. 
I choose to give up a little bit of my convenience or, or you know, taste enjoyment because to me it's more important that these animals and their environments do well. I don't even care that I may not see all of the outcome of it. I may not ever see a wild vaquita. Doesn't matter. I do care about them. And so many of us do care about them. We, well, thanks to the wonderful photographers out there that have given us pictures to be able to uh, enjoy them from a distance. And people like you who've created, who've recreated stunning. digital, stunning, stunning digital work. imagery. And this to me is, is so enjoyable to be able to do something that I can then apply to helping. To me, this really fuels me. Um, I, I try whatever I can to volunteer uh, for conservation initiatives because especially, and Lauren and Marcus, you guys were saying, pointing out very well, the last couple of years has have been brutal for many people. Um, I tend to be a very introverted person. Uh, pretty much on the autism spectrum, I tend to have a lot more stress with, uh, with people in the presence of people uh, physically. So I, I'm okay with being alone. But even in my case, I have found the last couple of years to be really rough in many ways. And I found it impacting my work. Even, even if it's made little difference in how, I, how much I see and in, interact with crowds, for example. It, we need things to recharge us. And you know what? I found very, very few things, almost nothing, that recharges <laughs> me personally as much as doing things to, that I know are impacting positively the biosphere. And there are so many things to be able to do that way, from going to the shore to picking up plastic on the, on, from the shore, for example, before it gets swept into the water. There are fun teams that are organized to do that, to doing these kinds of events where we are reaching out to thousands of people around the world and just encouraging each other to do what we can and that we know can make a difference uh, in this kind of this, this war we're waging against apathy. It's really what it is, is that we're trying to defeat those aspects in ourselves and our communities that would would rather look the other way. Um, and, and it is in many ways like a war. Uh, but however you look at it, it's wonderfully invigorating to become involved in projects of any size, small or large, or all of them, <laughs> that can make a difference. And it doesn't matter if it doesn't always make a difference. I've found that having this attitude alone and just doing something because you know it's the right thing to do uh, in terms of, of, of sustainability or protecting the biosphere is itself very rewarding. Um, it's, it's, it's just hard to describe it any other way. It's like, let's not wait for somebody else to do the right thing or for enough people to do the right thing for it to make, you know, to, for there to be a tipping point, let's just do it anyway, right? We know what's right to do. We have a lot of good ideas and we're going to share more about what's right, you know, what things help the environment, uh, both in the package and in the seminars today. But let's just do that. Let's use it. Let's apply those kinds of things and, and do what we can. And that does make a difference. And we've seen time and time again, many examples of where wildlife have benefited from individuals' actions strung together, summed up in a cumulative, larger impact, basically. You can make a difference as an individual, but you can also make a difference as part of a group. Both of those are very important, and both of them are highly effective. Julius, I'm curious, as you're drawing this stunning image here, I wanted to show people what I've done, but first of all, I need to ask you, yeah. uh, how, how long have you been creating art like you're currently doing for us? So, I mean, I've always had an interest in artwork. I've always been a kind of a hobby artist for a long time in my life. Uh, I started drawing when I was, I guess, like three or something. Uh, but so it's always been interesting to me, but I've really been commercially working as an artist and illustrator since 2005. So I guess that's okay. now been 17 years. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's been there. And, um, and I've, I've had the pleasure to work with a large number of, of wonderful researchers uh, to create press release images for their publications so that it, in, you know, it allows more people to see it in, in news media. Uh, and that, that's actually helpful a great deal for researchers to, have, to make their otherwise less easily accessible research visible to a larger community. Yeah. But also with uh, groups of museum uh, curators and exhibit designers to make huge life-sized 
paintings of dinosaurs and prehistoric sharks and all kinds of wonderful animals uh, and plants. Uh, life-size forests from the Carboniferous period, for example, in the Smithsonian's. Well, you uh, posted a video of drawing ferns yes, in a Carboniferous right. image. Mm -hmm. I think you were using that tablet, and it was really cool because you had zoomed in and you were showing the detail work of this fern, and it was... Yeah. Mesmer, I mean, watching you draw is mesmerizing. That's why I think it's so funny if anyone's interested. If you are drawing yeah, along with us, mm -hmm. um, as Julius is drawing his Vaquita, I downloaded an app. Oh, I don't know if you can oh, see excellent. it. That took me nine minutes, <laughs> but it's actually a really cool app. Oh, that's great. Thank that's you. Awesome. Oh, you're too really kind. Nice. <laughs> but no, it's, it's as uh, Julius is kind of zooming in and editing this little app on my phone uh, allowed me to do that as very well. Cool. So I'm feeling very see? accomplished. Just and like we're that. Gonna put that away. <laughs> In, in minutes, you can create artwork um, by downloading apps and then interacting with it on your phone and allowing your creativity to kind of show itself that way. That is really cool. See, that's that's the kind of thing you can do. Uh, it's super easy. Uh, there's so much technology out there now to allow us to do this. Yeah. And, uh, and, 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 and you can use it in so many fun ways. And it's okay that it takes time to do. It makes me think of a word I learned uh, from, from the Squamish Nation. It's... Uh, Tima Quetzi, <laughs> and it means it takes as long as it takes. Ah, uh, yes. And I've been using it with students. I've been using it for lots of people because I think we do put that pressure on ourselves that yes. something has to happen right now. And uh, Julius is going to continue to work on this beautiful piece of art um, throughout the afternoon, so we'll be able to go back and show that to you. Um, but I think we need to be a bit more gentle with ourselves and know that this Great. is a big topic that we're talking about. We're talking about a species disappearing forever which is a horrifying heartbreaking yes. utterly devastating thing to be thinking about um there's a lot of people who have been working on this problem for a long time there's a lot of people who are still working on it we're talking to them today um but sometimes when it does feel like things are overwhelming i think it is helpful for myself to remind myself that sometimes it takes as long as it takes tima quetzi it we have to be able to be gentle with ourselves in the process and the time it takes to to accomplish the things that we've been talking about here today so, so um true. yeah i think making it as beautiful as we can while we're on this journey is a big part so this is this Absolutely. is really exciting and and uh sort of a corollary to that as well is that we have community you're not alone uh we feel despair a lot right uh, when we see what's happening to the biosphere in many ways including the vaquita but remember that you're not alone there are thousands of people, all of us working separately and sometimes together in groups in many ways, working on these problems. And it is being done. And these people are very approachable. Network, make friends online, in person and so on with these communities. It's wonderful to be able to reach out to people who think the same way. It is so empowering and so gives you so much relief of the and respite from the despair. I really encourage you to do that because it does help an enormous amount. Uh, these days, uh, something that's becoming a very large, much larger sector of psychology is this, this concept of uh, ecological grief or uh, climate despair. Uh, people suffering a great deal from seeing the way that the biosphere is is taking a hit from our activities uh, and and it's something that's being talked about a lot more in psychological circles uh, in in education uh, in 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 treatment uh, of it as well and a lot of the times what one of the things that's being recommended of course is to to take action to to, to get involved with others uh, in these kinds of initiatives that help to right the problem because A, it helps you to feel better about doing something and B, it actually does address the problem and makes it better. So regardless, you don't have to solve the whole thing. You don't need to put all of it on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. Doing a little bit makes a difference and yep. that's all you need to do. If everybody does that, we could make a huge difference in the world. Uh, and so that's, that's the best way about it for treating the problem both in the in the in the world out at large and within our ourselves, our minds that are are so heavy these days from so much of this uh, this trouble that that we're experiencing. 
When, you know, you mentioned at the beginning, uh, it feels like a drop in the bucket, but, you know, after a while, those drops can fill the bucket. Absolutely. And we've got another drop here that we're going to be adding Excellent. to our bucket. Um, Julius is going to continue to draw. He's going to continue to add to his uh, very beautiful piece of art here. <laughs> but we are going to be uh, introducing our next speaker. Uh, we actually are going to be joined by Lorenzo Rojas uh, Bracho. Um, who is someone who's been working uh, hands-on with the Vaquita project for quite some time. So he's going to be joining us to share the current status of the Vaquita. Hi, Lorenzo. Are you there with us right now? Here, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. There's so, an echo. There's an echo. There's a bit of an echo. Um, we won't be able to fix that unless you use headphones, I think. Yeah, I try to make it from what they uh, are using properly. They didn't work quite properly. Uh, Give us one second here. So for anyone joining us, just give us a moment. We're uh, able to connect people from, from all over the world. This is actually kind of exciting. We did this last year and we're excited to do it again. So uh, we've got some technology that we can use to connect us. We're very grateful for that. Just give us uh, one it, it moment. It doesn't always work the way it's, it's supposed to. Not <laughs> that's right okay. <laughs> one moment, please. Yeah. <laughs> that was very professional. I think we've all heard that a lot. Of yeah. One moment, please. So, uh, Lorenzo, I guess uh, we're going to have to bring you in via Zoom. Uh, there's nothing else I can do about this echo. Uh, Zoom might be able to handle this a little bit better. If you want to hang up here and then just uh, dial it in via Zoom. And oh, we, can... we can't quite hear you, Lorenzo. Did you catch that? Oh, did we mute Lorenzo? Sorry, hello, Lorenzo. Hello. Oh, try to say something again. Okay, unfortunately, we're not actually hearing you at the moment, Lorenzo. Can you give me a thumbs up if you just heard what Marcus suggested? You did hear that. Okay, so we're going to see if we can reconnect with Lorenzo via Zoom. So we might have to get him to sign out of this one. There we go. We're going to see if we can reconnect with Lorenzo. We'll try to get some better audio here going for any of our uh, viewers there. Um, while we're working on that, um, again... If this is your first year joining us or you joined us last year, um, there's a lot of people out there who are working on this problem. And I think I have to say, too, you know, from talking to so many researchers who are working uh, to learn more about Vaquita, to protect them, there's a whole lot of reasons why we want to protect them, not only because they're worth it, they're living creatures, they deserve to be here. There's a lot that we can learn from this species that protects other species as well. So I can see Lorenzo has joined us. Um, it's nice that we can have this cumulative knowledge from so many people working so hard on this, proje on this project and this problem. Um, so let's see if we can get some audio check there with Lorenzo. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, oh, that sounds really great. Oh, perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you for uh, re-signing in there with us, Lorenzo. So happy to have you here with us today. Um, you're giving us a bit of an update on the current status of Vaquita. Okay, I'll share my screen. Thank you so much. Oops. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Can oh, you... that's so mean. Why would the host do that? <laughs> um... <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna make you a co-host, and then you'll be able to do this. Now you should be able to share your screen. Sorry for that, Lorenzo. I like no, your no T-shirt, by the way. That's a great T-shirt. Vaquita, don't Thank quit. You. <laughs> oh my god! I have so many screens. I thought I. Oh, I see something coming up. Can you see the screen now? We can. Uh, if you make it larger, you can probably, yeah, yes. there you go. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, well, thanks very much for the invitation to be here. I'm working now for OceanWise in organization in Canada, in Vancouver. 
and before I start, I let me move here a bit so it doesn't slip here. But I like to thank Tom, Marcus, and, and all the team uh, that have done this for, for years. And it's really, a, I was feel, feel honored to be in, invited to be here. So I, I'm going to give you a Bakita update, but not only the status of Bakita, general update where we are. And I'll start with a bit of history, probably, to remind you some of the issues. So it, it might be a kind of a chapters or a quilt uh, talk with lots of patches. And so I hope it, I make a good job. So first, it's something that I asked myself and recently I was discussing with friends why I solve a simple problem when a complex one will do. And we'll come to some of the crime dramas we're going through, some of the international issues, uh, some of the current conservation measures. And I would include there a patch on socioeconomic considerations because I had a last night with a friend uh, in, in a dinner kind of a discussion on this issue. And then, uh, so I put it that last minute really, and then progress with conservation recommendations, what we're doing, our most recent Makita monitoring and some room for optimism. So why solve a simple problem when a complex one will do? In 1961, Norris and Prescott, just shortly after Norris and McFarland described Bakisa as a new species, they report there was incidental mortality in gillnets for Totoaba sharks and rays. And some years later, the first meeting of the Subcommittee of Small Cetaceans of the Scientific Committee of the International Whaling Commission reviewed the status of many species. And when it came to Vaquita, they said the coastal distribution of this purpose where gillnet fisheries operate presents potential management problems. And, and certainly we all know that is completely true. In the early 1990s, Catarina de Acrosa did the first quantitative and robust sound study of incidental mortality. It was published till 2000, but we knew the results by 1995 or so because there was a special issue on purpose by from the International Whaling Commission. And she estimated 39 vaquitas were killed per year. The table to the right shows you the absurd mortality, the mortality rate and the estimated mortality. You can see shrimp, it's very high, even though it has a very small mesh size. There are so many of those nets that it's just a barrier for vaquitas. And then you have also channel, well, th those years was intense fishery for channel. And I put Sierra there because many fishers have told us, uh, especially in the last four or three years, that Sierra has a higher bycatch of Bakita than those two showed in there. And in that same, uh, of those same years, uh, to the same issue where Katarina published the, the, the first report, uh, Omar Vidal, uh, who was with WWF and as a pioneer working with Bakita, reported 128 records of incidental mortality in those years. And if we look what, uh, again, in the early 1990s, uh, Nori said that Mexican fisheries loss must somehow be made to work or the species will go extinct before we know it. And then he said just a few paid rangers with good boats and new jobs for fishermen would do the job. Probably was not referring textually, but I think the message was very clear. It's easy to do something now. And he asked himself, how will this happen? And so it's not 27 years. I changed that in, I hope this is the correct version I have, but it was 30 years now that he said that. And in 1995, you see the picture to the right, there were 245 uh, artisanal fishing boats. And that's by the time Katarina was there in the early 1990s. To the right, in 2000, probably 2009, Jose Campoy, who was the director of the biosphere, said he counted 1,629. And currently, I was asking a friend at the fisheries department, say they stopped counting pangas, which is, I don't know why they don't have a panga census, but anyway. So I called and someone told me that probably 900 and others said there are about the same number of illegal and legal pangas and he would guess like 2,000 or 3,000. So we don't know, but certainly there is there are much more than in 1995 when it would have been easy to solve the thing with 245 fishing boats. And now if we come to the international views, all these organizations in one time or another have expressed their concern 
about Vakita, and you will see history repeats itself twice. Uh, Marx said one, the second as a comedy. Here is as a tragedy. But all these show their deep concern about the status of the Vakita and recommended measures to, to eliminate incident mortality. That's a very vague recommendation, but it reflects certainly the concerns they had. So in 1925, look at this and you, you, it will sound that you heard this before recently. So the priority is to stop the main cause of bycatch by closing the Totoba fishery. Stop illegal Totoba trafficking at the US border. And since 1991, eliminate mortality in gillnets that it's about the same year the International Committee for the Recovery of Bakita Service has been recommended. And, and that photo to the left is one of the first photos of uh, Totuabanet in, in, in San Felipe in the 40s. Now, uh, in 1995, the Annual Prose Report of Mexico to the International Whaling Commission. This is what the report from the Mexican representative said. The Mexican government had taken measures to reduce bycatch by enforcing the closure of all commercial fisheries in the reserve zone created for this species in the upper Gulf of California. And all Totoba tight nets, which I'm not very clear what that means, were confiscated. Well, none of the two happened. The fisheries were never closed and Totoba nets or Totoba type nets have never been confiscated. So Mexico lied internationally about that, which I always find uh, incredible that that happens, but anyway. And now this progress report from Mexico is contradictory. And in that report, Mexico says that they have a study that shows that the reduced flow of fresh water from the Colorado River, which you could see to the right, that map is a major cause or the major cause of Baquita and probably Totoba population decline. Now the interesting, Mexico said that, but they never presented a report and they have never presented it. And many times they argue about that, use that, that argument. And of course, IWC, the scientific committee, had some of the top scientists in, in cetaceans in the world have rejected the, these statements. They said there was no evidence presented to support this environmental hypothesis. And, and here is a brief video in, in March 2020 of a very fresh bike. It was filmed by fishers that was bike on if there was any doubt. And the government didn't th thought this was a fake video. But anyway, we've known for over 70 years, and the time when it was right to and easy to control a fishing effort, that upwelling in, 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 in the upper Gulf and convention keep uh, a very fertile, fertile Gulf, upper Gulf, without considering the effects of the Colorado River. So that was 70 years ago, said, or more, sorry, by Gilbert and Allen. And there are recent papers that talk exactly about the same. And I'm not going to go into that discussion, but just to show that that argument is still being used when there is no single paper that shows uh, that uh, there is no evidence that the flow has affected Makita. And as uh, Richard Rick Bruska said, uh, this is just to affect the attention from the actual cause of decline by catching illegal and legal gillnet fisheries. So with that response, what was, and here's another deja vu, uh, the Sacramento Bee in the 1990s, they said, well, there, let's go for boycotts, let's go for public awareness and pressure over the Mexican government to see if this provokes solutions. And now we're living in an embargo right now, and there's a boycott right now. And interestingly, they also say diplomatic and political pressure through the North American Free Trade Agreement, the NAFTA. Now we have a new agreement and we're going exactly the same to see if Mexico is willing to take effective action to prevent the extinction of Vaquita. And so under these circumstances, this is where we are. The first survey we did, it was less than 600 Vaquitas. Now we are in less probably than 20, around 10. And you can see in the myelin graph to the left how quick we have lost the species in the last years, almost 40 to 50% per year. And of course, this has brought the international attention. And I was mentioning NAFTA, here you have the US, Mexico, Canada, and this is a new agreement. And recently the USTR, the United States Trade Representative 
has requested for the first environmental consultation under this, uh, this agreement. I'll mention something more about that later. And we have the, also the CITES notific notifications that Mexico might be sanctioned and they will not be able to export certain products that are listed by CITES. And I will mention shortly also something about that. And then to the right here, you would see that's the embargo announcement for seafood from the upper Gulf because of Vaquita. And many of you probably have not seen this video. This was taken by two fishers and you can see the Vaquita there. And don't blink because the Vaquita will come towards the screen and you can hear the fishermen saying, there's something there. I was told that one of those fishes that is on that boat has denied the existence of Vaquita. I, I, I won't say that's true, but that was the, the gossip. But important here is this video. You can see the, the Vaquita is coming here toward us and you can see the black patch if you look carefully. So anyway, where we are now, probably most of you have heard of Banda, which has done an amazing band and we have had a cascade of events with this sort of crime drama. And she published this article says that organized crime is taking over Mexican fisheries. And the beginning of having organized crime taking over Mexican fisheries in the upper government of shrimp is also has been taken by, the, by organized crime. was started with probably with the Totuaba. And in another paper, she mentions that the key part here is that this shrimp bladder that is used to cook a soup is used for financial speculation. And there is a very good paper by a friend of mine, that's the one below, Damian, who was the former consul in Hong Kong, and he studied well what was going, and he published this paper, and he said, Totoa traffic is a financial crime. So government actions will, know, will only be effective if they combat it as such. And, and he describes how this works, how the mafias or the Chinese organized crime use the money and use a different way to transfer the funds from Mexico to Canada or to Hong Kong or wherever. And so he says something that I think we've said before, but he said it so clearly that, and studied well that using these nature reserves or trade regulations and hatcheries like Mexico wants to export to Tualamit are and will be insufficient to save Vaquita. And good enough, here are two of the last uh, news. I think those are March, May in, in, in Hong Kong and in, in, in Vietnam of uh, trafficking of Totuaba swing bladders. So at the end, what we have is this lack of governance. And there's a short video that was December 2020, I think, when uh, there was a big riot. And you see to the left, there's a Navy boat that, that, that is being burned by or was set in fire by illegal fishers and to the right, thankfully nothing happened. What you see there is the marina and there's where we have all the diesel, marine diesel. And the good news is that some of those who were in these riots were, have been arrested. And sorry to continue with this, here is the criminality score from Mexico by the Global Organized Crime Index. And you see we're fourth in from 199, 93 countries and second from 35 countries and first of eight countries in Central America. And this includes not only human trafficking, but as you see, found out crimes. And in that place, you can see that trade generates hundreds of millions of dollars annually with the one pound of Totoba swim bladder. And you've heard this many times, the cocaine of the sea. And this is more valuable than uh, cocaine. And Mexico's illicit cucumber, cucumber has done. So it's not only the kid, it's all the ones. But what does this mean? If, well, let's compare it to Denmark. Here you see Denmark. Market criminality score is 3.87. And uh, I mean, there are 150 from 193 countries, 37 and second. I mean, it's just no way to compare that. We, we're the top of the table in organized crime uh, in, in the world. So with these, uh, let's go to what are the current measures that started in 2020. And let me show these. This is our, all the protect areas that have been 
trying to control Makita. So if you can see my pointer here, you see this is the southern boundary of the Biosphere Reserve. And then uh, this is the buffer zone where vaquitas are, where gillnets are uh, 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 usable. And here's the nuclear zone where uh, gillnets are banned. And the reason is when they make this, we didn't know as much as vaquita. And then you have, this is the gillnet exclusion zone, all this big area that covers all historical sightings of vaquita. And this is a 2005 extended vaquita refuge. And just recently, this is the zero tolerance area. So you can see your Baja, mainland Mexico, here is the, the US. And this is the zero tolerance area. That's was it. we proposed that in Sierra. And we could propose also this other large area and also to increase the size of the refuge, the 2005 refuge. So Mexico enacted new regulations, and many of you have heard of those. And it was published on the Federal Register on 24th of September. This is a zero tolerance area. How it's described is no fishing and non-entry zone in this 225 square kilometers, a small area. And this has to be said, it's going to be enforced through the year, 24 hours a day, through maritime, air and satellite patrols and surveillance. The agreement also states that bans the possession, manufacture, sale, transportation of gillnets in a, around the, that big area that I showed you, the gillnet exclusion zone. And no fishing at night or landing sites report bycatch and those gear pangas must be, uh, uh, are, uh, should have their vessel monitoring system. The net removal, I put that in dark because that's happening. But the next bullet, fishers turn over all gillnets within 60 calendar days of the date of the publication of this agreement. And there are other actions that were supposed to happen between 30, 60, 90 days. And none of, the, none of them have actually happened or are happening as they were supposed to be. And let me show you, because in July, this, this was also published. This is the trigger factors. And see if I can explain this because it's complicated. So to the left, you see the number of boats in the zero tolerance area. So if you have greater than zero and up to 20 boats, the default action by the government is going to be monitoring, continuous surveillance, deterrence, at least 60% of the available human and material resources will be designed to the upper gulf, which I don't know what exactly these material resources uh, means. And and, but if you have more than 20 and up to 50 boats, then you have the same uh, default action, but with 80% of the available human and material resources. And if you have from 50 to 65, then you have 100% of these resources. But if you have between 60 and 65, then you have a closure area and provision of any type. If you have more than 65 in a day, then they will close for a certain time of period to period of time the, for first occurrence, then for second occurrence will be 30 days, third occurrence 30 days and plus seven days, and then fourth occurrence like 30 days and everything is closed for 30 days. Now this sounds complicated. Now imagine there's a similar table, but with length of gillnets. And so in that table we say greater than so many kilometers of net and so on and so on and so on. But never is clear how they're going to combine the sightings of boats with length of net, and of course the the response to these trigger factor factors were lots of lots of letters from NGOs. But I'm going to mention two of organizations that Mexico is part of: the International Whaling Commission and the IUCN. And this this letter was signed by the Spe Species Survival Commission. Both letters agree that the regulations created a sliding scale of enforcement efforts levels to be triggered by increasing counts of unauthorized vessels and lengths of gill nets, what I was trying to ex explain. And these are when they are removed from the sea on a daily basis. And, and both let say this is a complex management program and would be almost impossible to implement and enforce. And moreover, it un undermines what it states in the Mexican law that this is a zero tolerance area. It doesn't say it's a 65 tolerance area, it's a zero tolerance area. And, it's not only that, even government officers don't understand what they wrote. 
uh, I mean, not all of them, but at least some here is an example. And this is the New York Times that interviews your Admiral Orozco Tocaven, which is a very good officer. But when they ask him about this, he says, well, we are adapting rule to the social needs on the ground. So effectively, we are allowing the presence of up to 65 votes. So there's no clear for the Navy that it's zero votes. And says we're trying to avoid confrontation. And another government officer when asked, he said, it's not a zero tolerance area, it's a fishing control area. And certain amounts of boats may fish and he believes there are 50. So he doesn't even know how many boats they are allowed there. And said, we have to see, well, then, then the Navy comes and tells you to go away. And of course, the result of this is this graph was the maximum count of, uh, of illegal boats within the zero tolerance area. So you can see the, those lines in, in that kind of pinky color are when Sea Shepherd is present. And then there's the maximum number of pangas in blue and, and, and uh, that dotted line is the maximum panga count. And it's a model when you have this kind of irregular data. But anyway, this is by Mark Taylor. What's interesting, you you see that there was a big uh, press release and, and uh, they made a big fuss, the Sea Shepherd together with the Mexican Navy saying that everything is working perfectly, that there was a substantial reduction in the number of fish, fishing vessels in the CDA. But what is interesting that the time they were making all these for us, a few days later, we had the maximum count of illegal fishing boats in the area on the 19th of January. And they did in the 10th of January, they, they, they did all this uh, kind of press release and, and media circles. And they do a good job, but that's not the way you, you do a good job by saying things that are not true. And I think what is important is just to consider that looks like a few days, but people just remember fishermen don't go out to fish every day. I mean, they have to go when the, there are good currents so they can have, uh, I mean, good tides so they, the, the gill nets can, can work. And if it's very windy, they don't go out, etc. So probably because of that, even if the people are saying that things are going perfectly well, the Navy came up with this idea. And I participated in a workshop uh, in FAO to, and, and there's a, a, a guide there of all the uh, measures you have to uh, reduce or mitigate bycatch. This is not in there. And, and so what they decided is, is to place one, 133 concrete blocks and, and they wanted to put them first with nothing. And we told them, the Navy, if you put those things, they're going to sink. That, that's very soft sea bottom. I mean, you're going to lose that. And so discussing with them, they decided to put these uh, hooks and have these uh, anti-net devices. And how it would work is you have a fisherman trolling their nets. I mean, this looks more than a Navy boat than a panga, but anyway, these are the floats of the net. Here is the net. And here would be the hooks that will catch these nets. And you will not see because it doesn't look uh, very well, but this, uh, they did some trails and there is the hooks here. And then there is a net that is stuck in there. And to give an idea of the scale here is the a fisherman sent me this photo of, of these devices with these huge hooks. Now, let's come back to CITES here with all these measures. So CITES had a second mission to Mexico in May 30, June 6 this year. And they did one to the upper Gulf this time, which they did in, in the first mission. And basically the report, and I have to thank a, 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 a DJ that sent me these, uh, these uh, bullets. And the positive part was an extensive commitment of resources and personnel. That's the report from CITES. That it has progress made and investigating role of criminal syndicates and cartels. However, since 2018, only eight individuals convicted of illegal take, possession, or trade of total. And there are certainly much more people, but a crime doesn't pay sometimes or many times. Now, the negative of the report is that the government has not prevent vessel use and fishing in the zero tolerance area. The report from CITES says there is no expecting of vessels and they're not stopping legal fishing. And I think one good thing 
this time side is it is they interview fishermen and fishermen told them illegal fishing is a daily occurrence and we all have been there uh, we know that and uh, Tom has been many times in our boats and he has seen that himself and fishermen are operating illegally and are doing it in plain sight without any consequences that's absolutely true and the number of illegal fishers is increasing year after year so basically the conclusion is not faithful implementing gillnet ban in the gillnet exclusion area no evidence of complying with manufacturing possession sale or transport of gillnets and not taking sufficient actions to detail illegal fishing in this huge area that I showed you. So it seems that Science Secretary and the US independently, they are going to propose revision to strengthen the decision text directed to Mexico to recommend that it expands its efforts to combat illegal take. And trading to Tuava to address the significant difference documented during the Secretariat mission. And I hope this will help. And many of you have seen this one, you haven't seen it, that is uh, Chris Johnson did a fantastic in 2008. And that's a time when Tom has probably still the best photos we have seen with, with Paula and Chris and probably is still one of the two top Vaquita videos so far. And let me come back to this and uh, you all know that the recovery team for decades, we were saying that if you want to prevent extinct you have reduced bycatch to zero and to do that you have to eliminate gill nets and to eliminate the illness you have to develop alternative fishing gear and vessel modification and last night a friend told me we never can had any socioeconomic considerations or giving any alternatives and i said yes we did we we have and what we all say enforce the law of those things are that are in red that have not happened and the ones with the in green turn are the best we've done so far. But let me make uh, just a parenthesis here on this issue. So there were some papers that asserted that the stakeholders were not engaged, nor was their welfare taken into consideration in addressing Vaquita conservation actions. And that papers were written by good friends and colleagues, Octavio and Andres, and they make good points in some issues. There's another one by Vasquez de Leon, which I don't think it's worth even mentioning. But anyway, that those were published uh, not far from each other. And I have to say that those papers didn't take into consideration. We had the Multi-Stakeholder Evaluation and Monitoring Committee, the OES. And they had a very strong presence of fishermen. Probably the majority in those meetings were fishers. And they met they made 23 times from 2008 to 2013. That's five times a year. That's quite a lot of meetings. And then there was a presidential commission that met six times in one year. That's two meetings per month. That's also a good. So, and in those meetings, where they were not only fishermen, there were the leaders of the national federations of fishermen cooperatives. So they were there. And I'm sorry, this is in Spanish, but this is the agreement that was signed in 2013 between the federal government and the fishers. And they say, well, there's going to be a gillnet exclusion zone. And the text there says that the fisheries organizations, that is the cooperatives, agreed to stop fishing with long lines and gillnets for all the species. And in exchange, they will be compensated. Now, you can criticize how this was done, but they were taking into account. It's a lie that that was not the case. And here's another paper in a very well-known uh, Mexican magazine, and they said the government paid 338 million pesos. And how that was paid, that was a mistake, that, because some received tons of money. So there were groups that received 12 millions, and there were some fishers that were because that they didn't receive anything. So we had to hire <coughs> those fishers to help us with ours so they could have a salary. And the International Committee for the Recovery of Paquita recommended not to compensate unless there were specific uh, things fishermen to do, like test alternative fishing gear or, or herb enforcement and so on. So anyway, these are just a few of the 20 re socioeconomic recommendations made by the recovery team. And one of them, of course, I'm just going to stop on this one. The, we made tons of recommendations about developing alternative fishing gear. And we got tired of asking the government. So at the end, we recommended to create an international expert panel, of the really worldwide experts in alternative in, in fishing gear. And this group would uh, have an alternative fishing gear assessment program. 
that would be transparent and would be implemented at a large scale. And thankfully, WWF cut that recommendation. Then they tried to do their best job. Sadly, the National Fisheries Inst Institute in Apesca, they were not engaged. And that's not said by me. That's also in a report from the United Nations uh, World Heritage Society saying that they didn't engage. And the committee of experts was the ECOV, the expert committee of fisheries, of experts in fisheries technologies. They have met many times and we helped uh, in 2018 to bring alternative gear to be tested at the fume tank of the Memorial University of Newfoundland. This is a small trial that they made recommendations to change the size and other uh, small changes. And these are the repairs, they're wind driven. And what is important here is that the equipment is already available to the shelf. That's what it cost saves. And they require additional field testing and then can be effective with just polishing and further testing. So there is that what has been not implemented. Not only, and not only that, fishermen want to test an gear they've designed. And you can see here, here's the rope of the net. You cannot see the gill net, but they had these windows within, in the, between those uh, yellow uh, arrows and there are the fishermen. There are photos at the Memorial University of Newfoundland, and we tested the the gear. They tested the gear, which just helped to have it uh, brought to to Canada and helped to pay for the fishers to go there. And the uh, the conclusion at the end of the COP is don't implement this. This will not save Vaquita. It's a, not a safe net. And not only that, we um, Sarah Mesnick was the mastermind, but we had a meeting. And what you see here, it's the main shrimp buyers from the US, the government officers, there's the minister at that time, and, and the fishermen, which are scattered. And from that meeting, there was a letter from the major US buyers to the government of Mason supporting uh, uh, the conservation of Bakida and saying there's an urgent need for enforcement permits because that has been an issue. Trying to test alternative gear takes a long time or it doesn't work because they don't uh, the government or the officials or authorities don't, don't give the permits. And then and they offered to help with alternative gear. So sorry I made this huge paralysis, but I just want to make sure that this is clear. Now, why recommendations have been hard to implement? There are many reasons. I'll just mention a few, come back to this criminality score because I will relate that to what I said previously. So we have the lack of governments and its civil twinge, which is corruption. And in that report, uh, they say that in Mexico, legal fishing could be up to 60% of the national production. That's huge, if, if that's really the case. But also that governments in Mexico, according to the World Bank, has gone from bad to worse, from zero to minus zero point twelve. And that's what the graph to the right is supposed to tell us. And internationally, we know that if, when you have low governance, you have more illegal fishing. Sorry? Am I over time? Hello? You're okay. Um, we have you until 11.30, so you still have time, Lorenzo. Okay. Yep. Okay, I heard a bell or something. So anyway, so what, and we know that speech are disappearing more quickly in countries with the worst governance scores. And there are many examples there. And also we know from several publications that's corruption undermines conservation when it pays better. And then that's a cl classical case here. Fishers can make from 500 to 10,000 per kilogram of swim bladder, depending on the quality. And we know that a fisher made got in 60,000 in one fishing day. I mean, and that money, he didn't keep all the money that had to go in bribes and everything else. And you see to the right, some of the to 12 illegal fishermen that now they just go out and fish. And it's very difficult to implement bycatch mitigation measures. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. When you allow, and you, and you, and you didn't take your conservation actions in time, you didn't do your homework, and then you have decades of lacking proper fisheries governance. And this is the sum of all our arrangements to manage fisheries. And these are the technical, the scientific, the legal, and, and et cetera. So those are, are, have been lacking for decades. And then the comp compensation scheme, and I mentioned that briefly before, when some fishermen got 12 million pesos, others didn't get. They turned to be perverse incentives. And they turned to be perverse incentives because it was badly planned, but also because of corruption. And eliminating gillnets seems like an easy thing, but involves major changes, it involves cultural, social changes. 
involves the will to implement alternative fishing gear properly. And this is hard in a communities that are rife uh, to corruption and well-organized crime. I mean, I, I don't think it's impossible, but it, I mean, it would have been easier in the early 1990s to get this all this. So to, to finish, I'm just gonna go th now through this, uh, uh, what we have done in 2019 and 20 to monitor Vaquita. And I'll just say that we have been, as many of you know, doing acoustic monitoring, but that has been complicated because illegal fishermen have been stealing our sea pots and also our ropes and anchors. And a fisherman said they have seen those in illegal nets, which really hurts. But anyway, so we cannot collect data in the past. And when I say stolen, stolen, I mean, dozens and dozens and dozens of, of, of uh, I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars in sea ponds. Now we could do visual line transects, but we cannot do that because it's so expensive and we could do it even with a few sightings, but that would probably come to over three million US dollars. That would, if you're gonna use that money to say how many vaquitas are, if that's not worth. So we're, I don't think we're gonna have any population size estimates soon. And, and, and probably at, at this point in time, the most, important information uh, is that there are still vaquitas there. And, and, and we don't need a pre precise estimate of how few are there, although we are always asking on how many are there. I mean, if it's, it's possible, but I think it's very important to know that they are there and to track the lives of, of these few individuals if, if, if that is possible. We also try photo ID. Uh, Tom and Paula and others, we uh, did this and there's a paper published with, led by Tom. And so we know we can do that, but there's always the winds. The winds are the main enemy to work with Vakita. It's really hard to work with them and, and just a few waves of buffer of more than two just gets very complicated. And then it's difficult to maneuver and do what we want to do when you have presence of illegal boats in 20, 21, uh, no, in, yeah, in 2021, we didn't cover the full area because there were a lot of people fishing in one extreme of the zero tolerance area. So to prevent any conflicts. And then it's difficult to cover survey areas and good quality photos when you have all these presence of illegal boats and you have winds and we haven't been able to get really recap recaptures of previous photo ID except once. And that came to a very nice paper from Bart, but anyway, and it's also hard for observers to match sightings. So you see one animal at 6 a.m. and then probably you see another one at 7.30 or 8. Is it the same animal? Is it not the same animal? So we designed this 2019 and especially the 2021 visual efforts, which is not really a survey. And these were funded by private funds from Sea Shepherd, Museo de la Ballena, and Ciencias Man and other private donors. And we tried to use and not to lose at the same time some of our acoustic equipment, which are mandolins very wisely, this program. And we wanted to solve these uh, three questions. How many different vaquitas or individuals were cited during the 2019 and 2021 20, survey, including uh, adults and possible calves? Two, how many vaquita calves, individuals, were cited in these years? And are there any signs that vaquitas are unhealthy? And the panels to the right show you the zero tolerance area and, and the tracks of the boats at that time. And uh, so in 2018, we had seven sightings with three days with multiple sightings. We only had two photo IDs and again, matched to that 2018 effort. And some of the sightings, at least two lasted for more than 45 minutes. And that really helped to track the animals and follow and try to uh, at least see what type of animal uh, individuals they are. But in 2021, we only had eight sightings during only 48 hours that th we had low winds. No sighting lasted more than 26 minutes. And we saw vaquitas to the Northwest of the zero tolerance area, a bit outside the zero tolerance area. So because of these complications, we decided to do this expert elicitation, which is really asking experts for their judgments and how it's described by Cormac and Thomas, which are led these exercises wisely. 
is that you these judgments, I said, in a uh, careful and structured process. And this is a viable way to provide short-term feeling of knowledge gaps. But at the end, what you want to do is to replace these solicitation results with real data in the future. However, in our, in our case, we have to synthesize the opinion of experts, which are our Vaquita observers, and Tom and others probably around have participated in these surveys. Because there's uncertainty due to the insufficient data or the lack of data. So instead of going forwards, we're going backwards. We're using it the other way around. And we're replacing data we don't have with this expert visitation. But anyways, it's a good exercise. And again, Cormac and Lynn did just a fantastic job. And here you see this to the left is the results of the 2019 survey. And the final elicitated distribution indicates that three was the most likely integral number for calves. So this is only for calves that were cited with an equal belief that the true value was between one and three or between three and five. So there was a 97% and that's when you construct a distribution curve on all these uh, opinions. And the, so we had 97% chance of two or more calves and 71% chance of three or more. That's basically what that graph is saying. And in 2021, the median we elicited in this exercise, the distribution number of was 1.5. So about the same probability for one or two calves. And here is the next, this is the total number of vaquitas and the most likely value was 11 and that distribution indicated that 85% believe that the true number of Akita cited was between uh, what's uh, between nine and eleven, and in 2021 uh, the likely values were seven and eight. With a final distribution indicated about 78% belief that the true number of Akita cited were between uh, what was it six and ten. So in summary. This exercise suggested that the number of cows in the zero tolerance are in May decreased a little between 2019 and 2021 and to the most likely number of vaquita cited in 2018 within the zero tolerance area is about 11 individuals, including uh, probably three, three calves. And the most likely numbers in 2021 is seven or eight individuals with one or two calves. Now, this last one I have to make very clear. This is not an estimate of abundance. It's just the minimum number of vaquitas that are there. So they might be more. And, but I still think we have room for optimism. And there are these two papers, the, the one in science and, and the other one uh, in uh, uh, what, uh, molecular ecology, one led by Phil Morine. And both agree that vaquita is not done because uh, genetic makeup. Uh, the, the lack of diversity is homogeneously di distributed through the genome. And this is a sign that there is no inbreeding depression there. And the other paper led wisely by Jack and Chris, by Jacqueline and Chris, is, concludes the same, is not due to extinction. In other words, a few animals, 10, you, the, the population might recover. But if you let that reduce, the chance of recovering just diminishes badly. So basically the mission is that they have time to purge those little alleles and what the makeup they have allows them to survive in, in, in this area. And we just recently published what I mentioned, but what is important here is that probably we have more vaquitas there because there are two options. We had a bias in our previous estimates, but also what we seen, and I think that's the case, that as Barb said, this is not a the vaquita surviving is not a random sample of all the vaquitas that were there. These vaquitas probably have learned or managed to avoid eel netting, getting entangled. And in 2017, when we tried to catch uh, vaquitas to bring them to sea pens, we saw one of the animals being able to avoid getting in gill net. And we've seen animals with scars that show that they probably had previous experience gill netting. So those animals are very valuable because those are the animals that could recover the whole population. And also the USTR announced the United States trade representative 
for environmental conservation with Mexico that I previous that I mentioned previously. To me, this is a brilliant opportunity to do something. I mean, to change really the tide and have the support of Canada and the U.S. that have expertise probably that we don't have one. We don't have a lot of them. And if there's political will, then I think this is a good moment to do. So I see this as a positive thing, and I don't see this as a negative thing that is being seen by many colleagues and friends. I think this is for good because the process implies trying to agree. It doesn't come to a punishment. It really starts with trying to agree best actions for the conservation of of Vaquita. This is probably the last video of a live Vaquita we have uh, from Museo La Ballena. That was the 2018. And I, I don't have the edited version, so sorry, but you will see th there comes the animals. And there's another, you know, moment, uh, another shot. And there are several more. I will not show, show all of them. But uh, and you, if you pay attention, you will see again the black patches around the eye of one of, uh, of, of, of the animals. There's just, there you see it. Okay, well, thanks very much for your attention and I hope I did well with time. Lorenzo, thank you so much for sharing that update. Um, it's really nice to see, I know you have the images of the, the concrete and the hooks and the, there's so many different ways of trying to get those nets out of there. And it was really exciting to see that there was groups of people involved um, who are suppliers of seafood that want to be a part of the solution. Um, is there any kind of closing thoughts you want to share about, um, you know, your experience and, and where things are currently at? Oh, I, I think we can leave that probably to our round table, but I'm just very pleased to see Telen is going to come after me. Amazing. Thank you, Thank you so much. All right, so we are going to be leaving Lorenzo. We have our next uh, presenter is Tillin. Um, Tillin, I'm going to get you maybe to pronounce your own name. I feel like I might be pronouncing it uh, incorrectly. Um, and before I do, Lorenzo, I'll get you to maybe unshare uh, your screen, if that's okay. Oh, I, I thought I'd unshare it already. Oh, it's already unshared? Okay, we're good. We're good. Awesome. All right, so I can see uh, Tillin on the screen here. Tillin, am I saying your name correctly? You are. Perfect. Oh, perfect. Nice. <laughs> well, we're excited to have you here. We're excited you're joining us. Uh, where are you joining us from? So I'm joining from Slovenia, from Europe. So it's now um, 8.30 uh, in the evening here. Okay. And uh, thank you all for having me. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so Tillin's going to be sharing with us the current status of the Atlantic humpback dolphin. Uh, so Tillin, I'm going to pass it on over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. If Marcus, if you can make me a co-host so that I can share my screen, please. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, seems to work. Perfect. Let me know if you can see the presentation and if you can hear me okay. Yeah, we can hear you and that's a nice full screen you got there. Okay, wonderful. Thanks again uh, for having me. Thank you for the invitation. So I'm primarily working with, uh, with dolphins. I, I've, I've done some large whale research, but my main focus have been uh, small coastal dolphins. And one question that we often get asked, and I thought I'd start with this because I know this is a mixed audience, is uh, why would we study dolphins? And my personal um, first response and the most honest one is because this is fun. Uh, let's face it, uh, as we've heard at the beginning from, uh, from Tom, uh, marine mammals and cetaceans, I think in particular are pretty fascinating animals. On one hand, they look like fish, kind of, and, uh, and yet they are, as I hope you all know, more related to us than to fish because they are mammals. And I think they're probably the most drastically modified, so to say, uh, mammals from some sort of an original, let's say, a typical mammalian form. And uh, I find them fascinating because they are both very different from us. They live in a completely different environment that, from us humans. And yet they share many characteristics with us. So um, 
I, I personally find them quite interesting to study. But of course, there may be more important reasons why we might study these animals. One of these is also that we consider these animals quite um, intelligent. Uh, they have high or, or complex cognitive abilities. And uh, by studying their, um, their behavior, their social complexity, etc., we can actually get an insight into how social complexity and intelligence might have evolved. And this in turn gives us some insight into how our, our own intelligent, uh, intelligence and uh, social structure may have evolved. Because as you know, we tend to live in quite complex social societies and we at least consider ourselves pretty intelligent animals. Also, as uh, maybe fewer of you know, uh, dolphins and other top predators in the marine environment actually have quite an important regulatory roles in their ecosystems uh, as top predators, but not just by removing physically the prey that they eat from the system, but also through something that we call uh, ecology of fear. And this is a topic of research that has maybe taken off in the last 15 to 20 years, not, not much earlier, which actually showed that the prey will behave very differently uh, in the system where the predator is present than in a system where, predator, where, where the predator is absent. So the prey will behave differently knowing that there is a predator around that can eat you. And this fear factor will basically affect and have um, cascading effects on other parts of the marine ecosystem, including uh, lower uh, trophic level or lower food chain level uh, animals as well as things like uh, seagrasses, algae, etc. So it turns out that these animals have uh, quite an important role in their ecosystem also through this. And then finally, as we've heard already today, uh, humans carry out a number of activities at sea, uh, which are directly or indirectly impacting these animals through a number of mechanisms. Uh, and so actually one of the main goals of, of dolphin and whale science is actually to uh, assess the status of populations, to assess the level of threats, uh, as we just heard from Lorenzo, and to, to try to actually find evidence-based solutions for these threats and, and try to uh, conserve these animals and their healthy ecosystems. Now, coming back to the species of, of my talk today, which is the Atlantic humpback dolphin, uh, this is quite an interesting and fascinating species. Uh, as the name suggests, they basically have this hump on their uh, on their back. Uh, so you've you've all probably heard of humpback whales. Well, these are humpback dolphins, and uh, these animals are relatively poorly known. And just to give you an, an example of uh, the difference between a humpback dolphin and a bottlenose dolphin, which you all may be more familiar with, this is the kind of let's say the typical dolphin that most people think of when they when they hear the, the word dolphin um, these two species do look kind of similar to to one another but you'll notice that uh, bottlenose dolphins don't have any hump whereas uh, the humpback dolphins do have actually quite a distinctive hump uh, i'll just mention that actually we know uh, four currently we know four species of humpback dolphins uh, but today i'll, I'll focus on the atlantic uh, species and just as, a, as an example, this is the, the bottlenose dolphin that I just mentioned. So the Atlantic, dolphin, the Atlantic humpback dolphin is interesting not only by its peculiar shape, but also by the fact that uh, the only place or the only region in the world where they actually occur is the western shores of Africa, and not even all of it. Uh, they, they just occur in, in a part of this range. And here is a map showing the countries where we know uh, Atlantic humpback dolphins occur. And you'll notice that Morocco, Namibia, and South Africa are actually not part of those countries. So this species is found only in portion of West Africa. And uh, the, the orange countries here on this map are actually countries where we don't really have good evidence of the species being present. And it's not entirely... No it's not entirely sure whether this is because the species is genuinely absent from those countries or there's just no data. But, but bottom line is, we, this species is highly restricted in their range. Now, you might think, okay, Western Africa is quite a big um, 
big region, so there's plenty of sea there, so there, there could be tons of animals there. But actually, when you look at their actual range, you'll notice that they are restricted to a very, very narrow uh, stretch of coastline. And these animals are actually not found uh, very far from the coast, and you don't find them in oceanic islands just off of the um, Western African coast. So these animals are highly coastal in nature, and they, they basically occur uh, very, very close to shore, uh, very often in, in surf zone. Um, um, you can also find them in uh, river mouths or estuaries or around mangroves, such as uh, on the photo here. Or in some cases, you can also find them quite a few kilometers offshore, but only in relatively shallow water. So in areas where you have gently sloping uh, sea bottoms or, or wide continental shelves, you might actually find them even up to 10 kilometers offshore. But as long as the water is typically shallower than 20 meters, you really don't find them in, in open, open sea. And these animals are uh, quite difficult to study because they're quite in, inconspicuous. They, they don't really make a big splash, so to say, when they surface. Uh, they are kind of low at, at the surface. Um, they, they are very unobtrusive in their movements. They're quite shy. They don't typically approach boats or bow ride the bows of the boats. And uh, they quite rarely actually display uh, substantial aerial behavior, such as jumps or leaps or whatever. And their, their proximity or their, their habitat uh, preferences, being close to coast, uh, unfortunately, also puts them in direct, um, uh, under direct pressure from human activities, which, as you can imagine, are mostly concentrated close to shore. And uh, as in most places of the world, uh, fishing plays uh, quite a prominent role in Western Africa. Uh, fishing is the only source of either food or income uh, for many coastal communities. And the, the fishing uh, occurring in these areas is what we call artisanal fishing, quite simple fishing, usually uh, just a couple of guys on a, on a wooden pirogue, with a, sometimes just with paddles or sometimes with, with small engines. And they deploy uh, nets, which are typically gill nets. You've heard about gill nets uh, from Lorenzo's talk. And these gill nets will typically be placed either on the sea bottom or at the surface or actually spanning the entire water column in quite shallow water. Uh, but the problem with these nets is that, that whenever you have substantial uh, number of nets in the water, there is a potential to have, of course, overlap with animals living in those areas, such as uh, dolphins. Now, here on this photo, you see the, a bottlenose dolphin on the left. Uh, not not the Atlantic humpback dolphin, but this is the same area also used by humpback dolphins. And uh, animals may approach this uh, the areas of fishing either because food just happens to be there and and uh, they are attracted by the same thing that the fishermen are, or they're, they're, they might actually be attracted to the nets themselves and they might go and help themselves uh, and and get fish which is already caught in the nets. Uh, as a, some sort of a self-service sushi bar. Uh, but the problem with that is that there's just not just one or two boats. Typically, there are many, many boats at sea. And when you combine all those uh, meters of nets, it starts to get into kilometers of nets. And that's when you start to have a problem. And for this species, for, for the Atlantic humpback dolphin, fisheries bycatch is believed to be number one problem um, that that uh, threatens threatens their survi survival, uh, and this can be uh, either linked to uh, direct hunting. So animals might be caught accidentally and then used utilized for food, or in some places there is di di direct hunting ongoing for sustenance. So for people meat consumption. Now also uh, as in many places the, of the world, but for potentially, uh, particularly currently in, uh, in Western Africa, there is huge coastal development and uh, there is a lot of new port constructions all over the region. And this, of course, uh, places these animals under additional pressure because it can uh, remove their habitat, it can uh, degrade their habitats, 
their habitat either through physical modification of the actual shoreline and the, and the seabed, uh, as well as through things such as chemical pollutants, which uh, are uh, able to affect these animals. So due to all these threats, um, Atlantic humpback dolphins are listed as critically endangered by the uh, IUCN Red List. And currently it's believed that fewer than 3000 individuals in total exist. Uh, and this is a combination of the fact that the species is already quite restricted in range naturally, uh, and then exacerbated by the fact that, that it's under considerable, considerable amount of human pressure. And out of these 3,000 individuals, uh, less than 1,500 mature individuals are believed to be um, present in the entire population. And as I said before, this population appears to be quite scattered into smaller population so it's not just one big population and the problem is we, we currently have substantial gaps in both knowledge about their distribution abundance their life history uh, their health and of course also the scale of threats but there's also gaps in the capacity of uh, local scientists and local expertise that can study these species uh, local capacity of organizations that can raise that can raise awareness uh, and uh, report sightings, strandings, and actually capacity of local communities that can contribute to conservation. And finally, there's also uh, there are also gaps in resources, both in terms of funding, uh, educational materials, uh, and and know-how. So because of all this, um, the Consortium for the Conservation of the Atlantic Humpback Dolphin was formed in 2020 uh, with, uh, with the aim of working towards long-term uh, survival and sustainability of the species uh, and their habitats. And uh, the Consortium is trying to, um, to achieve that through a, a combination of research, uh, raising awareness, capacity building, and concrete action uh, in the field. And uh, you can uh, you're, you can visit the the website, which is tri trilingual in uh, English, French, and Portuguese at susatutsi.org. And uh, the consortium currently uh, includes over seventy different partners from around the globe, including fourteen from nineteen of the of the range states, and it includes a mix of people, including scientists, uh, NGOs, international. Uh, um, government intergovernmental organizations marine protected areas government agencies agencies etc uh, as a, as part of this effort uh, a number of tools have been developed both for uh, educating the the public uh, such as the children or or uh, fishing communities in particular and um, last of the the last of these efforts was uh, this year in uh, in guinea which you can see here on, on the western uh, coast and uh, the aim uh, was to actually obtain more information from Guinea, which as recent as 2010, we only had one record of this species formerly um, existing, which was uh, a, one animal landed at a fishing um, landing site in 2002. So until 2010, this was pretty much the only record of this, this species in the country. And then later on, uh, one of our colleagues, Caroline Weir, uh, carried out a short survey uh, photo identifying uh, these animals off of the uh, Rio Nunez estuary uh, um, close to the port of Kamsar. And uh, uh, various colleagues also carried out uh, surveys and um, beach surveys for strandings to, to try to get a better sense of which species of cetaceans might be present in Guinea and, and uh, at, at which level. So we tried to build up, to build on these two um, studies and uh, headed to the northwestern part of Guinea uh, to try and survey for the animals with the aim of getting a better sense of the occurrence, habitat use, uh, population size, behavior, and threats to these animals. And, um, we also we, so we carried out uh, surveys at sea using small boats, uh, usually actually pirogues, and we also uh, had a very strong capacity building component in the project, in which we uh, which we have or we are training local scientists and local students uh, in uh, data collection techniques, 
so that uh, they could actually carry this story uh, forward on their own in, in the long term. So we had a number of, of training um, sessions in the field and in the classroom on how to uh, survey for the animals, how to collect uh, water measurements for, for studies of habitat use, um, how to uh, carry out uh, photographic ident identification of the animals and so on. And we also worked a lot with uh, local fishing communities and local communities in general, uh, as well as uh, marine protected area uh, rangers, uh, both to try to um, raise awareness of this species, which is quite a special species, which is, you know, as I said, endemic and specific to this region of the world, but also uh, trying to get a better sense of the of how many species and which species might be occurring in the area from fishermen themselves. So utilizing the so-called eco local ecological knowledge to better understand the, the presence and occurrence of not only humpback dolphins, but also other species in the region. And uh, there has been quite a lot of uh, goodwill from local communities willing and eager to, to engage in this sort of work. And uh, remember, I showed you this slide just, just uh, a, a few seconds ago. So this was the primary beautifully designed survey which we thought we were going to carry out well as, a, as it often happens reality tends to be very different so uh, there was a number of both logistical and weather challenges uh, which basically completely prevented us from doing this sort of a nice systematic design so we had to resort back to more opportunistic design so these are actually our survey tracks uh, shown in green that we used but uh, nevertheless, we did manage to cover quite a lot of ground in about three weeks. And uh, we did manage to have uh, five sightings of Atlantic humpback dolphin, uh, as well as some sightings of uh, bottlenose dolphins. And even though this is just five sightings, considering all the logistical and weather issues we had, we were actually quite pleasantly surprised by, uh, by actually having this number of sightings in a really relatively short period of time. Now, you can't see it from this photo, but one of these sightings actually involved quite a large group, uh, about 12 animals in the same group, which was quite a, uh, a nice sighting because uh, these animals tend to be in rather small groups. And most of the groups that we encountered actually had uh, calves in them, which is always uh, a, a nice and positive thing. And uh, because we collect uh, um, photographs of these animals, we actually can uh, build up a catalog of individuals because we can recognize them through their natural markings on their dorsal fins. And uh, this with time can, can get us uh, a better idea of the population size through certain things like marker capture, marker capture modeling, we can actually estimate how many animals are using that area. And we, we can also use the same data to look at uh, things like uh, fecundity and social structure. And uh, we were quite pleased to see that, uh, that we had at least some re-sightings of the same animals in the area, uh, which may suggest that, that, uh, that the area might actually be important for animals in the long term and not just them being random uh, passerbys. So, this is kind of a very brief overview of what we've been, what we've been up to so far. We're going back in November this year uh, to, to hopefully collect more data on these animals and in, in the long term uh, build a better understanding of, of their numbers and threats and contribute to, to the wider objectives of the, this whole effort. And even though I, I kind of gave the example of Guinea, there's there are several parallel uh, efforts going on in, in Senegal and in some other parts of the West Africa to, to try to get a better holistic picture of, of the species. Now, this also brings me kind of back to the Vaquita story, which uh, for us is always uh, both a model and also are a painful reminder of uh, what needs to be done and and how quickly it needs to be done, because as, it's, as it looks now, the Atlantic humpback dolphin pretty much might be the next one standing in line behind Vaquita with the most uh, serious threat of, being, of going extinct. So Vaquita actually provides a really good model on how to react to this uh, significant issue of dolphin conservation. 
uh, both from a political, scientific, and also social uh, point of view. And several experts uh, associated with the Vaquita uh, conservation efforts are actually helping in this effort as well. So everything you heard um, Lorenzo speak about is actually a huge um, lesson also for, for the plight of the Atlantic humpback dolphin. And I'll end here, and I'm happy to take any questions either now or later. And thanks again for having me. Thank you so much uh, for your time there, Tillin. That was really interesting. I know I've seen pictures of the Atlantic humpback dolphins before, but they're they're really stunning and, stunning, and I didn't realize that the population was as low as what you were describing. Um, I think what we'll do is, uh, we know we have a panel coming up in a little bit here. So, Tillin, I think if we have any questions about the Atlantic humpback, we'll save them uh, for then. Um, I wanted to... Uh, move on and we can have our conversation with Dr. Anna Hall uh, and then I believe we're going to be bringing everyone back together uh, shortly around 12.30 or so. So thank you so much for your presentation. That was awesome. Are you able to, I don't know if you already have un, unshared your screen? I have, oh, yes. Awesome, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so we're going to move on to another one of our very knowledgeable presenters, researcher. Um, we are going to be joined by Dr. Anna Hall, uh, who is a member of the Porpoise Conservation Society, who's putting this talk on here today, this whole, um, this whole piece. But um, she's going to be giving us a porpoise conservation update. i um, not too sure if we're going to be specifically on harbor porpoises or other porpoises, or maybe all porpoises. I don't know. We're going to find out shortly. Anna, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you. So good to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you very much. I just uh, need yep. to get my screen shared here. No worries. You're very brightly lit. It's very, very bright in Victoria today. Yes, I'm, I'm actually... Well, let me see if I close the blind. I've... Uh, and the camera seems to be picking this up quite brightly. It's actually the room is 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 dark. Um, let's hope that that's that's better. Okay. That's okay. A clear yeah. Improvement. So much better. There you go. Okay. Very very good. You're looking now, quite angelic is... still. This is good. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, now we're gonna see how well I am able to square, share my screen. Um, let's just see here. Oh, I think we're having a technology issue. That's okay. Can you see my, my screen? Not yet. Marcus, do we have to do that adding her thingy? Uh, the, the, it wouldn't be a, a real Zoom meeting without <laughs> the... Oh, there, something is oh, happening. Oh, yes. see it now. <laughs> Are we there? Oh, thank goodness. Technology. Beautiful. I'm much better out on a boat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So you can you can see my screen and you can hear me. Yes, so thank I can. you very, very much for, for having me and um, what wonderful talks so far today. I'm um, I've learned so much. Um, so I would like to give you um, an update on basically porpoise species status. Um, for up to 2022, so we, we checked everything yesterday, so I'm hoping that we are 100% up to date. Um, and we're, I'm going to talk about some of the other species of porpoise, but then of course bringing it back to vaquita as uh, today is the international, uh, international day to save the vaquita, and that is the species that has brought us all together once again. And I just have to say how happy I am that we are still able to have these these um, virtual get togethers uh, to talk about vaquita because as Lorenzo said, they still exist. They are still with us, which is fantastic. Okay, and now it's not changing the screen. Why not? There we go. Okay, so for those of you who know me, you will know that I love porpoise. I think that they truly are the world's greatest small cetaceans. Um, they're incredibly interesting. They're incredibly diverse, and there are still so many mysteries that we have um, to, to discover and uncover about their submarine lives and the, their, the, the social aspects of their world. Um, and so many people 
would say, well, where do I find these amazing porpoise? Well, they are actually distributed around the world. Um, I've used this slide many times. Again, um, another wonderful illustration by Uko Gorter. Um, and you can see that the harbor porpoise, which is in uh, the dark blue here, is actually found throughout the Northern Hemisphere. Dolls porpoise are endemic to the North Pacific Ocean. We have the fantastic finless porpoise that are in the coastal regions of, uh, of Asia. Vaquita, of course, the most limited distribution as we've already heard in the upper Gulf of California, Sea of Cortez. Uh, we have Burmeister's porpoise, uh, which is in the dark green around South America. And then we have the mysterious distribution of the spectacle porpoise of the Southern Hemisphere. So much to learn about that particular species. So they really are found around the world. Um, but you can see here, with the exception of the dolls porpoise and probably the spectacle porpoise, we're talking about animals that live very, very close to human populations uh, in our near shore coastal waters. So lots and lots of opportunity for interactions with human activity. Um, these are uh, illustrations also done by Uko um, that show us the finless porpoise, so a very aptly named. And we have two species of finless porpoise. And then we have the Burmeister's porpoise of South America, very sleek looking animal. This is the only sexually dimorphic porpoise uh, where you can readily tell the difference between the two. The spectacle porpoise, the smaller female and the larger male. Dolls porpoise also have a little bit of sexual dimorphism during the reproductive season, um, but this animal is, is certainly the easiest of the, the seven species of porpoise to tell male from female. Of course, we have the fantastic vaquita, and then uh, the northern hemisphere animals, the harbor porpoise and the dolls porpoise. And these two species are actually sympatric, and, and I'm talking to you today from Vancouver Island, um, and I happen to live in a part of the world where I can see both harbor porpoise and dolls porpoise. Um, in the same waterways. And, and I heard the, the reference earlier today about group sizes getting up to about 200 animals for harbor porpoise. And I um, probably to the envy of some of my friends who may be listening, but uh, just a couple weeks ago, we were out with an estimated 200 to 250 harbor porpoise. It was an amazing sighting. And so with all of these different species and this huge distribution around the world, People often ask me, well, how are these species doing? Um, and, and this is, it comes as a surprise to some people when we put together the information. So if we talk about the global status or that which is put together by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature or the IUCN, <clears throat> looking at harbor porpoise, there are 37 countries around the world where this species is found. They are listed by the IUCN as of May 2020 as least concern. And as I mentioned already, they live in coastal waters. There are some regions where they will actually move into offshore waters as well. And um, Eastern Canada and Eastern United States are certainly regions where they move further from shore and also in the North Sea. But if we look at this big distribution, the population trend as assessed by the IUCN is actually unknown. But we do know that there are areas of, um, where the habitat quantity and quality is continuing to decline. And that is a conservation factor, a very real conservation factor for harbor porpoise. Again, looking at the global status of dolls porpoise, we see the same status assessed in March, 2017. This species is only found um, in seven countries. And again, the coastal and the offshore waters. We have a current population trend also that is unknown, but similarly, we have a continuing decline of habitat quantity and quality. Moving to the vaquita, which of course Lorenzo has just given a wonderful presentation on. We know that this is the most endangered marine mammal um, on the planet. The IUCN lists the vaquita as critically endangered um, just a few months ago, found only in one country, as we know, in the shallow waters of the upper Gulf of California. And we know this population is decreasing, and we know this population is decreasing because of bycatch and gill nets. We see something similar but, um, across all of the species that presented so far for the Indo-Pacific thinless porpoise. The IUCN classifies this species as vulnerable, found in 18 countries um, of the Western Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. But again, a decreasing population trend. And again, we're talking about a decline in habitat quantity, quality, and bycatch. And we see a very similar trend here, narrow ridged finless porpoise also found in Asia, only three countries. And again, it's the shallow coastal waters in Western Pacific Ocean. Population trend is decreasing. 
And we see a similar trend, continuing decline of habitat quantity and quality and bycatch. With the spectacled porpoise of the Southern Hemisphere, uh, we know it occurs, we're thinking about 10 countries listed as least concern, but we actually have got very few data for this particular species. So again, a population trend unknown and bycatch is a threat. Same with Burmeister's porpoise, listed as near threatened, February 2018. Five countries of the coastal waters of South America, also an unknown population trend, and we have bycatch as a threat here as well. So just to summarize this, because that's, it's a lot of information, we look at the seven species of porpoise, um, which are the harbor porpoise, dolls porpoise, vaquita, two types of finless porpoise, burmeisters and spectacle porpoise. And we see that four of them have got an unknown trajectory for the population. Three of them are listed as decreasing. If we look a little bit closer, because we know with the harbor porpoise in particular, the IUCN recognizes one subspecies and one subpopulation as also being in trouble. The Baltic Sea subpopulation of harbor porpoise is also, like Fakita, listed as critically endangered with a decreasing population trend. And the Black Sea subspecies, uh, there are three subspecies of harbor porpoise. We have the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Black Sea. And the Black Sea population, subspecies population is listed as endangered also with a decreasing population trajectory. So if we take this and we look at these trajectories, we actually have greater than 50% of our species, subpopulations or subspecies, which are now known to be decreasing. Um, and I don't think that we should sit back and uh, think, well, the others are okay, because actually we don't know if they're okay. It's listed quite clearly as unknown population trajectories. And for those that are in decline, the common factor is human activities. And if we look very closely, we will find that those are largely related to gillnets as uh, we have heard about the Kita today. The threats overall around the world for porpoises, far and above the others, entanglement in fishing gear is the single greatest threat to these animal survival. These are very small marine mammals, um, but because they live in uh, coastal areas, many of them, habitat degradation is probably a close second. Uh, there are regions, and even where I live in Vancouver Island, there are regions where the animals used to be seen uh, very close to the city of Victoria, and now you have to go several miles out before you will find them. So in the last 50 years or so, we know the habitat here, they have lost some regions because of degradation. We also know in some regions, directed killing, um, is a threat. Anthropogenic noise, underwater noise, is a real factor for many, many marine creatures, but we know that porpoises are particularly sensitive. And we recognize that for some species, if not all species, we have data deficits. We just don't have enough information sometimes uh, to be able to make informed decisions. And there are likely others. And in fact, just this morning, um, I heard that, uh, that there is a risk for Indo-Pacific Indo finless porpoise. Uh, they've had some individuals washed up without their um, pectoral flippers attached anymore. They have been cut off. Um, and there's an investigation in Bengal into this. There are some very local issues. Uh, for Burmeister's porpoise, we know that these animals in some regions of Chile are being targeted, uh, killed, and parts of their bodies being used for bait and fisheries. We know in the North Pacific Ocean that Japanese hunting is, can, is a significant factor to the number of animals that are alive. Uh, in 2013, 2014, we had approximately 13 and a half thousand dolls porpoise killed or reported killed. Similar for 2014, 2015. Uh, 2015, 2016, we had the lowest um, recorded catch of about 12,000 animals. Uh, there are some researchers out of Japan who are now saying that the number of dolls porpoise is declining, they're becoming more difficult to find. And perhaps that's because over the last 20 years, over 190,000 of these animals have been taken. And since the 1960s, more than half a million have been killed in this hunt. Um, as I mentioned, we are having, um, we just got reports just this morning that porpoises in West Bengal are 
coming ashore. They have been monitored over the last uh, 10 years, but in the last two years, over a 10 kilometer stretch of the shoreline in East Midnapore, uh, we're having animals come up, wash ashore, stranded with their flippers cut off. Um, and that was updated as of just yesterday, August the 19th. And there is an investigation that will be taking place. And I, I hope that, uh, that nothing sinister comes of, of this, but mm, I'm not sure how optimistic I am of that. And in some cases, we have threats that are a real global issue. And in this case, we're talking about bycatch. And it is global, not only for the species, uh, not just porpoises, of course, entanglement is indiscriminate. And these nets act as walls of death and they will entangle any creatures, turtles, dolphins, whales, other fish. Um, and it is particularly devastating, of course, for small populations. But some people have asked me, well, you know, why, why worry? You know, and I, I've, I've even had people tell me about Bakita. Oh, just give up. They're, they're doomed. And I, I don't subscribe to that. Um, and I do worry, even when some, some animals like harbor porpoise or doll's porpoise do have relatively large distributions. And the reason that I worry is because I believe that there are enough lessons. We have enough information. We are not data deficient when it comes to animal extinctions because extinction happens. It's real, it happens to widespread species, to those that are considered reasonably abundant, uh, to those that live in spatially restricted habitats, and also to those that are considered common and widespread, and those that are considered local. And here are just a few examples of animals that we know have gone extinct. This is the thylacine or the Tasmanian tiger. The last known individual was captured in 1930 in Tasmania and subsequently died. Uh, the Western black rhino declared extinct in 2011. We've got Lonesome George, who's very famous, the Pinta Island tortoise of the Galapagos Islands. He died on June the 24th, 2012, was the last of his species. Uh, the passenger pigeon, um, this is one that really is an example of those that are considered common and abundant. This animal was actually considered the most abundant bird in North America with a population estimate of three to five billion animals um, or individuals. And this animal was declared extinct in 1914, entirely due to human activity. And then we have the Pyrenean ibex. Um, this species was gone as of January 2000. And so it's not all historical. Um, there are very modern examples uh, of, of species we have lost. And of course, if we move into the marine realm, this is what extinction looks like. When the, when the animals are gone in the wild, all we have left are the museum specimens. And this is Baiji. And Baiji was a freshwater dolphin in the Yangtze River that was declared extinct in 2002, um, very sadly. And this animal was sympatric with the Yangtze River finless porpoise. But it's not all bad news. Um, we have uh, had had finless porpoise calves successfully born at, through the Institute of Hydrobiology's um, expert guidance and, and care in Wuhan, China. Um, and the recovery actions that China are taking at the moment for finless porpoise, uh, they, they recognize the lessons learned through Baiji and are taking extraordinary steps that should be a model for the world when it comes to um, porpoise conservation, because it's not all about the bad news. There's good news as well. Um, China has similarly for the conservation of Yangtze finless porpoise has implemented a 10 year fishing ban as of January, 2021. So it's about a year, just over a year and a half in to improve finless porpoise habitat in the Yangtze River. And of course the Yangtze River is heavily influenced by human activity. Uh, and in, in this case, uh, they're reducing the competition with people for the prey species um, and the ecosystem effects for the uh, Yangtze finless porpoise. They've also diverted or slowed vessel traffic and increased the levels of um, surveillance and assistance for entangled animals. And for harbor porpoise, which of course are considered um, to be widespread and least concerned by the IUCN, we've got two wonderful examples of habitat restoration and having harbor porpoise return to habitats that were previously uh, lost to them. Uh, the Thames River estuary uh, near London, London, England, was an area that the porpoise used 
they were very common in the 1800s. And then the river was used um, really as a, a dumping ground during the Industrial Revolution. And in fact, it was declared, the Thames River was declared ecologically dead back in 1957. There have been concerted efforts um, by a number of groups in England and, and um, notably the Zoological Society of London to reclaim the habitats and clean up the Thames River estuary. And there were two surveys, one in 2015 and most recently in 2022, that confirmed harbour porpoise have moved back into these previously degraded habitats and are continuing to use them. Uh, the same for Northern California uh, with the removal of the gillnet fishery, which of course was um, prevalent through the 1930s up to the 1980s and harbour porpoise were entangled uh, annually in, in large and sometimes unknown numbers. The removal of the gillnets and now we see a return of harbour porpoise. And so it's uh, Lorenzo mentioned that, that removing the gillnets is very, very difficult, and, and that it is. I certainly don't um, underestimate that. But when it is possible, the animals have the ability to have a habitat that returns uh, to what is more amenable to them. And luckily, in these cases, we have seen uh, re habitat restoration and recovery for the species. And this is something that I find to be very important. Um, one of the notable ecologists uh, in North America, probably around the world, wrote many, many years ago that animals choose the places that they live in, and that's because it's suitable for them, um, whether it's for feeding, whether it's for breeding, whether it's for their physiological requirements. And I think that's really important to remember that these animals exist where they do because those are the habitats that work for them. And it is the human activity that has degraded it. And so I'm hoping that, um, as we always have on, on the International Day to Save the Vaquita, that our actions can counter some of the negative effects that have taken place with human activity. Um, sorry, this came from uh, Animal Ecology, which is a fantastic book that was published in 1927. All the porpoises really need are safe habitats, some good food, and a few friends. Um, this photograph was taken during the day when we saw over 250 animals, or 200 to 250 animals. Uh, this was one small group that was very surface active. Um, we can improve porpoise habitats, porpoise um, conservation through research programs, and this is just a few of the ones that uh, I'm involved with. Um, with harbor porpoise, we're very concerned that these animals do, of course, live very, very near shore. And you can see the grass. This was taken from Porpoise Conservation Society research site uh, in Queen Charlotte Channel. And we know that they live very close to shore. And so if we think about what has happened in uh, the Northern Hemisphere, and our study site is near Vancouver, British Columbia, what has happened in the last 100 years? Well, this is uh, actually a, a relative of, uh, of ours. This was their house in 18, 1885 in Granville, that's a city that no longer exists because it actually burnt to the ground shortly after this picture was taken, but it resurrected itself as the city of Vancouver. And of course the shoreline has been forever changed. We are studying the near shore coastal distribution habitat use and behaviors of the porpoises that still exist in this region so that we can set baselines for the future and take today's knowledge and implement it in conservation measures that will ensure that hopefully we have harbor porpoise in this region for um, many centuries to come. We've seen a variety of behaviors. Uh, we also have a boundary past study site of Saturna Island in the Gulf Islands in British Columbia. Seen some aerial behaviors. So we've seen some confirmed mating. So um, we know the habitat, habitat is certainly conducive uh, for mating. And we also see calves. And we know that there are also nursery areas in this region where the females return to year after year after year um, with their calves. And so uh, we talk about the cultural importance of, of fishing for people and, and that is recognized, but I think it's also important to recognize that there are habitats that are culturally important and socially important for porpoises as well. Um, this was our study uh, and our collaboration with folks in Scotland and Wales and COVID has certainly put a little bit of a, a slowdown on this, but we're uh, definitely ready to, to get going again. It was encouraging in, um, in uh, the United Kingdom that special areas of conservation were announced for harbor porpoise in 2016. They've certainly done a great deal of work there on looking at the importance of particular habitats. 
Uh, we have research programs that's through a Porpoise Conservation Society and Garlock Marine Wildlife Center and uh, uh, the operators and owners there, working with them, building on many years of local work and also collaborating on, collaborating, pardon me, on photo identification, um, recognizing that this this idea that animals use these habitats year after year after year, photo ID is one way to, to demonstrate that. And we're um, very pleased to be collaborating on that. And of course, a number of years ago, we had the first annual Sea Trust Porpoise Symposium and it was fantastic to sit in the room and talk with people who were um, as excited about porpoises as, as we are. Uh, here back in British Columbia, again, COVID delayed this, this project, but it's, it's getting up and running shortly. Um, we're looking at Dolls Porpoise and Harbour Porpoise distribution within the Salish Sea, which are the transboundary waters between British Columbia and Washington State. And over the last two decades, we've seen a distinct change in the number of Dolls Porpoise that are utilizing the inshore areas. But we really have got a paucity of data um, on, on this particular species here. So we're hoping to um, determine what the current distribution and habitat use of the Dulles Porpoise is in, within the Salish Sea and provide information to update the current status in Canada because they, of course they were last assessed in Canada by the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife back in 1989. Um, we recognize that perhaps there's been oversight in identifying regionally relevant threats. And so we're uh, working on um, developing a matrix so that we can consult across many different uh, sectors of marine experts, in, including researchers and um, tour operators, uh, fishing guides, um, First Nations, to look holistically at what some of the regionally relevant threats may be in this area. And as I just mentioned, we're collaborating across many sectors um, of the, the marine environment and the blue economy. And our goal is to help create some solutions to determine what is actually going on in this part of the world, but also what can we do to help? There are great advances being made in understanding the social lives of porpoise, and, uh, and by great, it's it's um, it's slow and steady, um, but we will get there, and there will be a, a, a very interesting paper coming out soon um, on on reproduction. So stay tuned for that. Um, Cindy Elliser and I looked very closely at what has been going on in the Salish Sea for harbor porpoise and looking at knowledge gaps and research and really what we need to do as a society to protect their future. Um, for those who want to read the, the details that was published in the Frontiers of Marine Science in uh, just over a year ago now, May, 2021. And we're also involved in a multi-species research program with the Patch Dot First Nation, which is located near Port Renfrew on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And we're now in year three. And this is a collaboration um, with Pachidot, with the ECHO program, uh, uh, the Port of Vancouver, and looking at the distribution of many different marine mammals um, in a huge section of Juan de Fuca Strait um, in the Canadian waters. And we will gain insight over time into how the animals are using the habitats here. Again, very, very close to shore, but also the offshore region of Swiftshire Bank. And what we know is that all creatures um, they need safe sanctuary in order to survive. Um, research helps contribute to that, but so do the, the actions and the management and looking at viable alternatives. To bring this back to the vaquita, um, you know, th these were images that were produced by the um, Penrith Public School and provided to us. And I just think that a picture is worth a thousand words sometimes. And we need education and we need cooperation. And there are many, many people who are aware of the vaquita and the plight of the vaquita because of events like this. But we also know that we have to have sustainable practices to have healthy populations. And in looking at the seven species of porpoise, we know that gillnets are a ubiquitous threat. It occurs around the world, not just for vaquita, as I mentioned earlier, but for countless species. Um, and if we can work to remove those gill nets, there are many, many people who are aware of the vaquita and the got an echo because of events like this. But we also know that we have to have sustainable practices to have healthy populations. And in looking at the seven species of porpoise, I think somebody is watching the live stream uh, at yes. home and hasn't forgotten to mute themselves. Yes. <laughs> I won't name anyone, but I think it's you, Tom. Countless species. Yeah, I'm trying to find out. Um, and if we can okay. work 
he found it. Sorry, Anna. Okay, nope, that that's okay. So just going back to the the uh, sustainable practices and healthy populations, um, you know there there are calls to action um, that stem from events like this, and conservation can be done. You know around the world, whether or not we live near Vaquita, uh, and I certainly do not, but I make decisions every time I go to the grocery store, um, as Julius was talking about earlier, with regard to the packaging, but also uh, you know, selective, being selective about what you purchase and sustainable seafood is one way that we can all help the Vaquita. Um, the sun has not set on the Vaquita yet, as Lorenzo mentioned. Those individuals that are out there are tremendously valuable, not only because they simply uh, are still exist, but because they, they are the survivors and they will pass on that information and um, be able to teach their young uh, to, to hopefully avoid the gill nets. We have seven species of porpoise, and we have seven oceans, but we only have one planet with porpoises and we really need to work together because all of the porpoises need safe sanctuary. We've got to help them around the world. We've got to clean up our oceans, whether it be gill nets or plastic pollution, um, the effluent from rivers, how we treat our freshwater systems that, that enter into the marine environment and form these estuarine habitats that are so important for so many species. We need to really think about the fact that we have got over 50% of what we know with our species that have got declining populations. We really do need to work to save our porpoises and I believe we need to work today. We need for so many species around the planet to eliminate bycatch. Restoring habitats will lead to restoring populations. But as Lorenzo mentioned, alternative livelihoods for, for those who make their living within the marine realm also need to go hand in hand with all of this. We need to have porpoise friendly techniques and just yesterday, I learned of um, what could be a very promising advance out of Germany with um, gill net modifications. And there's been some trials in the North Sea showing that harbor porpoise are in these early stages avoiding the gill nets that have been threaded with tiny beads made of acrylic glass. And apparently it's making the, uh, the nets acoustically visible to the porpoises, um, sorry, in the Baltic it was, which of course is where we have got a population that is critically in danger. Um, and these sorts of actions uh, and all of us coming together to talk about this will protect the porpoises' futures. Um, everybody can take part, uh, whether it be remotely, because of course Christmas is coming, you can adopt porpoises. Um, Porpoise Conservation Society is not the only organization that, that, uh, that needs help. Of course, we have a Vaquita, um, Sea Trust, anybody that is working on porpoises uh, could use support. The animals need the support. And of course, um, a lot of the work that I've talked about today, some is my own, some um, of course is other folks. And I would just like to acknowledge that the conservation of the Vaquita is global. People are paying attention and thank you to everybody who has been involved so far or who will be involved. Um, but in particular, I would just like to say thank you to, to those fishermen who are working in the Sea of Cortez, who are taking steps despite great challenges in the local area um, to work to protect the Vaquita in a very challenging um, and sometimes dangerous situation. So I'd just like to say thank you to everybody for, for their attention and for the time and I hope I didn't go over. Um, thank you so much for having me here. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anna Hall. Uh, really good to get your perspective on this, and and I appreciate the, uh, you know, looking at all the different species of porpoise and and saying exactly as you say, you know, that's a conversation I often hear is why do we care if there's so many, you know, harbor porpoises, for example. But as you said, you know, we've got those three subspecies, and I was able to interview someone recently about the Baltic Sea harbor porpoise, Ida Kalien. Um, so yeah, there, there's so much we don't know and that we need to know. And I appreciate you kind of wrapping that up with that uh, hope there at the end, which I know is for anyone joining us, that's that's why we're here. We, we care, we know we can see some light somewhere and how do we chase that light? <laughs> um, so what I wanna do, Anna, since we have you here, 
Um, we are going to be doing our panel discussion. So we have several of the folks that you've already heard from here today. They are going to be having a bit of a panel discussion about Vaquita, um, answering some questions. So if you as a viewer do have any questions, uh, you can contact us with those through the online services that you're using to watch this. We do have the ability to see those questions and answer them. Um, but it would also just be great for us to have our, our experts chatting with each other here. So I I think, uh, is it everyone that we've heard from so far today, Marcus? I think that's it. So many people we've heard from today. Um, and we can bring Anna up on the screen. I hope there's other people now too. Once they start talking, we should see them. Uh, I see Tillen has joined, as has Tom. We only see Anna right now, but it's a speaker. So it's because you guys are not talking. Tom, maybe we hand it over to you for this panel discussion. Okay, yeah, I think we're all here except for Tom Keekafer. Um, I'm not sure if he's going to be able to join us or not. I hope he got the message that we need to connect through Zoom. But anyways, we'll begin, and hopefully he'll get a chance to join us at some point here. Um, the talks uh, today uh, were amazing and all very informative. Um, I hope that the viewers uh, learned something. I know I did. Um, and, of course, watching Julius do his amazing art, uh, this time in a digital format, was pretty amazing as well. Um, but I think there's a lot of good messages here that um, we need to pay attention to. Uh, probably the, the thing that to me is most striking is the message that um, all these different species of small cetaceans that were talked about in the various presentations today, um, they're all facing various levels of threat by human activities. And although the threats are varied and to a certain extent, there's a common theme there. Um, and one common theme is entanglement in fishing nets. Um, it's been uh, shown, I think, through some recent literature reviews that entanglement in fishing nets, uh, and in particular in gill nets, is the single number one threat to most species of small cetaceans in the world, and certainly to, to the porpoises, to the, the seven species of porpoises as a group. So um, this is something that obviously we need to get a handle on. Um, I, I think probably all of us here and probably everyone in the audience as well um, are very much pro-fishermen. I, I know I certainly am. Uh, we shouldn't view the fishermen necessarily as bad guys that are doing something wrong. Uh, many of them are trying to make a living um, at a very challenging profession, but we need to do a better job as a society, I think, to try to develop methods of um, allowing fishing to occur in a way that does not endanger populations of porpoises, whales, turtles, seabirds, um, sharks, whatever. Um, and so um, I just wanted to kind of open up to the panel discussion about um, if anybody has any sort of innovative ideas about things that can be done to try to bring this about that haven't been tried before or haven't been um, maybe tried with enough effort. Um, it's a very challenging problem and it's going to involve some real um, creative solutions. And just wanted to see if anybody has any ideas they want to throw out about some things that maybe uh, we need to, you know, move towards to try to solve this problem on a global scale. Anyone? <laughs> it is challenging. <laughs> it, it's a very challenging, uh, challenging question for sure. Um, I, I think the one of the I think there's really two pieces to it, and um, Lorenzo, you certainly know more than I on this. The, We've got the, the, the legal fishing, but then we have the illegal fishing. Um, and support of legal sustainable fisheries is perhaps a, a, a message. The, the illegal, as, as Lorenzo pointed out, is so damaging, but I really liked the, the comments that he made, and I'll turn it over to you, Lorenzo, with regard to looking at that as, as financial versus fishing. Um, I, I think for the legal fishermen, certainly the folks that I work with, they're equally as upset by illegal fishing because of how damaging it is to, to their resource, but also the ecosystem. And, and um, Lorenzo, perhaps I'll turn it over to you if you don't mind, as you are much more um, informed of these sort of illegal type actions and the damage that can occur from that. Yeah, sure. And it's always good to see you, Anna. <laughs> and it has worked several times with us and participated actively in surveys. So uh, the same as Tom. 
I think, I mean, there's so many smart people around the world. And I was talking to Gianni, if, well, when they develop mobile phones, they put all these experts in a room and close the doors and say, well, you're not coming out until you come <laughs> with a good idea. And they came out. I mean, we have everybody has a mobile phone right? And I always thought probably that's a good idea doing with MIT or these big think tanks and bringing experts from all over the world and in different areas and put them in the room and really discuss through, through several days or weeks, I don't know, what can we do? Because there might be some ideas out there that we don't know about, but there, there's probably there's an engineer that works with phones somewhere else and has might come with some ideas. So I always thought putting this think tank or something with all these experts, then it would be hard to choose who, who, who would those be. But I, I think that could come with solutions because at least in Bakira, as the committee of experts in fisheries technology said, they're on the shelf. There, there, there are things in there that we can use and, and improve. And certainly some of the things that would be usable in the upper Gulf might not be good in, in Africa with the humpback dolphins, and which I was also, by the way, very happy to see you're active in the field work there, Tim. So I think that's one option, but we have seen now also that despite pingers or these acoustic deterrents, they seem to be working in more places. I mean, when we started with pingers, things were different. Now we are seeing, giving good results with car purpose in the UK. We have seen them, uh, probably in Peru, working either with lights or with only acoustic deterrents. So I think the technology is there. In our case, and I'm concerned that might be in other places, is when you get all these organized crime getting into your place, and we know this is not the only area in the world where it's, where it's happening. It might happen elsewhere. Uh, colleagues from uh, Sri Lanka and from Bangladesh called us and told us the Chinese were arriving there to look for the next uh, Totuaba. So in a way, I think we have all to get our minds together and, and think, and what I said, I think corruption, lack of governance, lack of proper fierceness management, it's a big enemy. And you might have the alternative gear, but if you don't have all those components together in, in a good place, then it it will happen what is happening in Mexico. And uh, I was remembering as you were presenting, Anna, that we had the head of the fisher some time ago. He transferred gillnet permits from the southern of the Gulf of California to the upper Gulf of California. And, and I asked him why the hell he had done that. I mean, you know, like there's Vaquita and he said, well, you know, I we didn't thought of that. And then I found this guy when he left the government and I asked him, why does the fisheries department doesn't support and help with Vaquita? And he says, because if we help Vaquita, then we will not be able to fish because next time we'll be dolphins and then turtles and then manatees. And then, so, so that's a very prim primitive way to look at things. But I think it's a key part to have these multidisciplinary teams get together because you have to consider all these different components really, really to work. And uh, the Danish have all this fantastic, I mean, the, uh, in, in, in the Swedish have this alternative of, uh, pots for shrimp and we haven't been able just to put them there because there's a little group of I don't want to insult anybody but there's a group in the government that will not promote that and as I was saying we have all of these potential economic problems and that doesn't move many of the authorities that's amazing but anyway I think you have there are things there there is this think tank that I I hope we can do it sometime and might be give us something as they gave us cell phones and many other technologies that that you can come with some of these new and different ways to look at. Because usually it's, it's all of us, the same people going to the same meetings and thinking and thinking and thinking, but probably bringing all these group outside and in a think tank that might be a, an option we can try. I'd be happy to discuss further that. Yeah, that's a very good point, Lorenzo. Um, and for some of the people viewing, they may not realize this, but the tuna dolphin issue um, in the Eastern Tropical Pacific, which um, back in the 1960s and 70s and 80s was a huge, huge conservation issue, probably more dolphins killed in that fishery than any other single fishery in the world. 
Um, it's certainly not completely resolved at this point, but um, the situation has been brought under much better control uh, in terms of bycatch in recent years. And much of that occurred through um, working between cooperative work between uh, researchers, um, gear technologists, and the fishermen themselves. In fact, a lot of the most effective conservation measures were actually developed by the fishermen themselves kind of on their own. Um, so I think it's very important to remember um, in terms of what Lorenzo is talking about that, you know, this idea of bringing a bunch of experts together should include um, representatives from the fishing industry as well. But yeah. obviously they need to be people who are really interested in, in working cooperatively to solve the problem. Uh, as we all know, there are some members of certain fishing communities that do not want to solve the problem and, and are not willing to cooperate. But there are ones that out there are out, are out there that are willing to cooperate and help, and they should be uh, an important part of the solution as well. I think uh, it's important to remember that that has been that has been done before for porpoises as well. Um, the bycatch of harbor porpoise in eastern Canada and eastern U.S. was driving the population trajectory down for many many years. Um, and a, a similar thing that took place, I'd actually forgotten about that until just now when, when you were speaking, that uh, there were researchers and fishermen who came together and they changed the fishing practices. And in Canada, at least, um, the, the, pop, the, the conservation threat level for the harbor porpoise in the Bay of Fundy has actually reversed its direction. And instead of the, the population declining, it's increasing. Um, and I believe it's the same in the eastern U.S. Of the, in the Gulf of Maine that the population is going up um, or holding steady. But so it can it can be done when you have the right people in the room, um, recognizing there are significant differences and challenges between uh, where the Kita live and uh, and where the Harbor Corpus are. But nevertheless, all it takes is the right group. And and so far we still have the Kita, and so we we still have that that possibility of success. Yeah. Yeah, now that you mentioned that, that's Karen Fournay's paper on mm -hmm. the recovery of harbor purpose in California. I mean, it's 9% per year, something like that. I mean, it's just yes. amazing. And, and I agree with Tom. I think you, you need the fishermen there. I think one of the failures when only the government was trying to develop uh, alternative gear was to keep fishermen away. Yeah. And so they would come with a design and fishermen would have to test it when those who really know how things work are. Uh, are the fishermen? I was impressed. I, have to this, I shouldn't say this, but when we were discussing with the Navy uh, about putting these blocks with the hooks, and I said, "Well, we need the fisher technologies from the government to help us," and they were there, but it was clear they don't know how to fish. They don't know the area. They don't know many things. So you need to, certainly to bring the fishers and and all stakeholders at some point. They have to be there, but. Uh, I, I think there are some really simple technology parts. I'm trying to remember who's doing it in, with marbles in a bottle in Africa and testing if it, the sound uh, as the marbles hit the glass. Per, per, per Bergren. Oh, Per, yeah, that's yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, Per is doing that. So yeah. we don't know if it works, but I mean, there could be some simple solutions in some areas and maybe some other more complicated in, in, in other areas. But I, I think that these are, uh, especially uh, early conditions. I mean, British Columbia is almost like a brand name of of environmental responsibility in the world. I mean, when, at least in Mexico, when we talk about ten, uh, Canada and especially British Columbia, it's like talking about Switzerland. And, 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 and so it's like a very responsible area. And so, so it's most of Washington, California, but we don't have that public engagement or that uh, engagement of most inhabitants to do things. And then in those areas like, which I think it's Africa and Tilan was mentioning lack of education, lack of scientists, lack of, of understanding. And, and I just think it, how many fisheries managers in the world, especially in, in countries like Mexico, have this thought that if you protect a species then you will not be able to fish. So. And I'm sure there are many in other places. So you have to work all those things together. And, and, and one of, I guess, the things in, in Vaquita is that managers pretend they do something and they never take the difficult decisions. They just kind of play with, oh, let's have a protected area here or let's have a, this there, but never really banning illness and promoting uh, the use of alternative gear. Yeah. 
you know, uh, Lorenzo, from being in, in British Columbia, um, that that's that's a, a, a lovely perspective. Uh, but you know, I and I think that um, and I we're, we were doing some work in the Caribbean, where which had some similar uh, social issues um, as is in Mexico. And I was speaking with um, actually a, he was a former whaler um, in the Caribbean, and he he really didn't like what was going on. And I reminded him because he thought, you know, oh, you're from British Columbia and, and the whales there have such protection there, which is true. They do. You can't even get within 400 meters of a, of a killer whale at the moment to and, and allow them to have the, the acoustic space and the physical space away from humans. But if we look back in our history, uh, it was only in the, the 1960s, 1970s, where killer whales were shot on site. They were captured and sent around the world. This is where this is this is where most of the the uh, killer whales that went to the marine parks, they, they, that was founded here in British Columbia and Washington state. And so um, I, you know, I know that the, the social change is, is very difficult, but the changes that have taken place on this coast from the fifties to now, I mean, I have fishermen that come up to me and say, I really feel like I need to apologize. And I say, well, no, because it was a different time, different place and we learn. And so I think those types of Looking at some of those lessons in regions like British Columbia, which is very, very um, ecologically minded now, but it wasn't, and and so those transformations are possible, and and I really like the idea of engaging um, with the particular fishermen who are trying to do things the right way, um, and certainly that's what we're doing in the Caribbean as well as is, is moving forward in those directions and supporting the individuals who are as as you have done previously with the work with Vaquita but supporting those individuals who are willing to try something new. Um, that it's, it's very, it's important, but social change can occur. And, and I think BC is a great example of that because um, we didn't always think the way that we do now about marine animals. Yeah, yeah that's a very important point. Um, yeah, Tom, Tom Kikefer has something to say. You're muted still, Tom. Mute myself. Yep, there you go. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious about these crystals that you're talking about. Are they like marbles or whatever? Or do they have actually like hollow? Are they hollow inside to create an air cavity that can be more receptive to echolocation and reverberating? I think Per was trying different options. They did uh, these uh, metal. <laughs> marbles and then they use crystal marbles and they were doing other I mean, it hasn't worked but I, I mentioned this because it's interesting to look at these because if if they i mean not nothing we know so far reduces bycatch to zero i mean there's yeah, nothing yeah. but you can mitigate it and probably if you can find areas where you, just by mitigating you save populations as populations and trying these uh very cheap, but you have marbles and you have bottles everywhere in the world. So th that's more my example. I, I can send you the, the the report. I know I have it somewhere. I'm sure uh, Tilan has it too. Yeah. But just, just I mean, one other, whoops. Yeah, go ahead. Um, they they already make a fluorescent fishing line that's hollow in the center, and it's sold. I've forgotten the company that sells it, but it's already available to fishermen. And I'm wondering about making gill nets with that type. I mean, it's hollow in the center. It's for fly, it's for casting and fishermen at nighttime. It's also bioluminescent or fluorescent and it's reactivated by the sun during the daytime. At nighttime, it glows. So we've got two options, an air cavity that could reflect and also a visual component. I think that those ones, I think they might work because if they are hollow, they are not so heavy. So if an animal gets entangled, might be able to break it, yeah. build this entanglement. But the heavy ones of monofilament or multifilament, all those once they get entangled, I mean, it's yeah. hard for most to, 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 to disentangle. So I, I, and actually, I was thinking when well, we we're catching uh, or trying to capture vaquitas to have them in the sea pens, the nets that the fantastic Danish team that helped us came with. They were hollow nets, gill nets, hmm. and they flows, and they were easier to disentangle the animals if they, if we were, they were caught and difficult to transfer. So yeah, that might be, a, in some areas and some species, that might be a, a good option. Yeah, and it's important to, uh, sorry. Um, it's important to recognize, though, that um, 
for each particular uh, fishery and each particular species, there's going to be, you know, particular solutions that are appropriate. Yep. Now, obviously, one thing we have to recognize, of course, is for the vaquita, you know, we're way beyond any kind of technological solution in terms of modifying gill nets, um, because we basically need to reduce gill net catch to zero. So the only real solution is to just eliminate gill nets in the vaquita's range. But for species like harbor porpoise and doll's porpoise that are relatively numerous and occur in multiple populations, um, you know, there is a lot of potential for a lot of these technological solutions to be tested. And we have, you know, large enough populations and enough fisheries that we can get the data to see whether or not these different things work. So this, this could be something, you know, that could be a real um, game changer in the future, potentially. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really no, intrigued. Sorry, I'm really intrigued. Um, and we actually just came across it just yesterday about the, uh, the, the German testing in the Baltic with the acrylic glass beads. Yeah. And, and, and it, was, it was sort of promoted as very low tech, very, uh, you know, not expensive. But the purposes, the the trials are showing that the animals are avoiding the nets. They can detect them. Um, so actually, it's it's on my to do list, <laughs> uh, vaquita aside, but just in general for purpose conservation to to look closer into the work that uh, is being done and, and tested in the Baltic because I think if something like that, where it's lightweight, it's low tech, um, it's easy, relatively easy to implement. That might be you know. Um, E easier to promote uh, to, to fishermen who you know don't have unlimited amounts of money to try different things. Right. I was going to make the same point that Tom made that it's going to be very species specific, area specific, and fishing gear specific. Because, for example, Lorenzo or, or somebody mentioned lights. So lights turned out to be very efficient for reducing turtle bycatch in Peru. However, I was involved in a project where we were testing the same type of lights in the Mediterranean and they were not reducing bycatch whatsoever. So it's very, it can be for the same type of animals, from the same type of species, generally different area can make a big difference. So uh, what might work for one area might not work at all for another. Area. Yeah, I agree completely. I agree with that. And you know, for, as you say, for the same species might be worked in one area and not in another. But now that Anna was mentioning, I'm probably telling you remember too, we had a presentation of this German technology and they were playing with beat and they were building different types of one. And I remember there was a photo of this kind of a factor building this and there was this engineer estimating how much noise they would make. And, and so I think what it's important is this people thinking in these alternatives and we should encourage the, those things. But uh, yes, yeah, and a word of caution, I always said you need a menu of alternative fishing gear. So even in one area, some fishermen might be very comfortable using one type of alternative gear while other fishermen might feel more comfortable using a different one. So even in those cases, you might need more than one alternative gear. In a toolbox. And, and it has to be simple. It yeah. has to be quite simple because what we learned with the lights is that the fishermen hated them because they were getting tangled in the nets, they were difficult to put on, they were difficult to change the batteries. So in that case, it was it was a major nightmare for the fishermen. And it was actually shown to reduce their target catch, which was another yeah, yeah, problem. A, yeah. Because in Peru, it didn't reduce the target cat, catch. I think it even increased it slightly. So they were interested in actually using them. Yeah. But in our case, completely different. Uh, Marcus and Lauren, do we have any uh, questions from the from the audience? Were, were people able to send in uh, questions to the chat box or something? I'm not sure if we got any anything there, or if that was uh, working properly. Okay, the the last time I checked, there weren't any, but uh, let me have a look again. At um, there were a few earlier. I think one that that I liked. I have to find it again. It was on YouTube, I think. Um, how is the demand for Totoaba being addressed in China? Uh, without the demand, uh, the Vaquita and the Totoaba uh, will stand a much better chance of survival, uh, says Reina on, uh, on YouTube. Yeah, uh, this is, I mean, I would say in normal trade, that would be the case. And probably one of the examples is that Tom gave when we had these tuna dolphin porpoises as well. <laughs> There were some uh, consequences for the Mexican fleet uh, or fleets that killed dolphins because you had a regular trade. But when you are talking about black markets and trafficking, 
the logic is completely different. Now, this is not a demand for meat, it's a demand for swim bladders. And they can be really expensive. We have seen prices go from relatively cheap to, uh, I think the most expensive one was about 100,000 US dollars for a kilogram of a very well in an auction. So it's the demand made for the swim bladder, it's made by rich people, those who can pay for that. Yeah. And they don't care about anything. They just, I mean, the, for them, their country is the money and that's what they do. But also what I was saying in my presentation, the soup and all those things, it's probably the minimum part we have to be concerned about. It's that it's being used for financial okay. worldwide uh, black mon money laundering. So it's a financial crime. And that's something we really have to take into account. So it's not only reducing demand as long as organized crime uses these. Uh, and, and there's a name I'm trying to remember, but I will not in Chinese, how they do those things. So they might uh, sell swim bladders and the money in cash goes to Canada and then it transits away on the, on the other until it gets in cash arrives to China. I mean, it's a whole complicated network and I, I don't think I can explain it. But anyway, being a financial crime and it has to be treated as a financial crime, it's not only about reducing consumption. There, there's a global and more complicated issue there. Yeah, I think for the vaquita, um, that's one of the things that really adds additional complication to the, to the problem is that now the situation, it wasn't always that case, but the situation now is such that um, organized crime elements are involved both in the, um, you know, in fishing in Mexico and in smuggling the products, the totoaba bladders across the border. Um, and in getting them into markets in China and Hong Kong and other, other places where uh, the Totuaba bladders are, are you know, desired. So there's this criminal element that makes the whole problem so much harder to resolve. Um, and I don't think, I can't think of another situation um, in cetacean conservation that has such a large um, you know, contribution to, um, to, to the criminal element as in the Vaquita situation. So that, that is a challenge, but I want to make sure that um, I know we're running low on time here. So I want to make sure that we don't end up on a, on a doom and gloom note. Um, and uh, I want to make sure that the important messages that have been um, put out here today are um, very much, uh, we're aware of those and are repeated. And that is that the Vaquita is still here. Um, it's defying expectations in many ways in terms of um, animal surviving and still producing calves. We know from the latest survey in 2021 that there are still vaquitas out there swimming around in their habitat. Those animals all look very healthy um, and calves are still being born. And so despite the fact that it might sound like a pretty hopeless situation, and I realize that probably many people may be thinking, wow, this, is, this seems really hopeless. The fact of the matter is that there has been several recent scientific studies that have looked at various aspects of this, and, and Lorenzo mentioned this in his talk. One is the um, studies that have looked at the genetic uh, composition of the vaquita population and have shown that because the vaquita is historically a relatively rare animal, that inbreeding depression is not the issue that it would be for many other types of animals. And that even though there may only be 10 or 12 vaquitas left on the planet today, they do have the capability of surviving and thriving and increasing their population if that threat of gillnet um, entanglement is removed. And then the other issue is the study that Lorenzo actually led recently that shows, or at least uh, provides evidence that in fact, these animals that are left are doing better than we would have expected. We were seeing a few years ago evidence that the population was declining at about 50% per year and the estimate of abundance and the estimates of the number of cows between 2019 and 2021 weren't really all that different. And if that is an accurate indication, it suggests that in fact, the population isn't declining that fast anymore. And we think that maybe one of the reasons for this is because the remaining uh, vaquitas are sort of the survivalists out there. You know, They're the ones that basically have learned how to make a living and catch fish and evade these gillnets. They can lead to areas where the gillnets are not as uh, likely to entangle them. So, you know, this is something that we can all kind of uh, latch onto to give us hope. 
in what might seem like a sort of a hopeless situation. So I just kind of wanted to, um, you know, finish up our discussion on that note and try to make sure that everybody understands that there's no reason to be to, to lose hope in the situation. Um, the Vaquita still has a chance. And as you can see here, there's a lot of people um, who were with us today and many, many others behind the scenes who are really fighting hard to make sure that the Vaquita has the best possible chance of surviving and that we give it, you know, every every edge that we can to, to beat the odds and to make sure that there's still Vaquitas around for, you know, our children and our grandchildren. So hopefully that will be the case. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank everybody who participated today, um, all the people that you see here on the screen, uh, all the amazing talks that were given um, were fantastic and very informative. Um, also, I want to thank uh, Julius and Lauren for their contributions as well. Um, they worked really hard to put this together and to make this a, a really successful event. And I think first and foremost, I need to thank the disembodied voice that you've heard periodically throughout the day. And you see his uh, still image there in black and white, probably on your screen. But that's Marcus in the upper right there. That's only you. Um, you only, is... only you see the black and white image. <laughs> oh, okay. you, can't, you can't see it. All right. Well, I can see it. And it's a good reminder to me that Marcus um, is an absolutely critical ingredient of what we did today. We literally could not have even dreamed about doing this without him. Because A, he knows a lot about porpoises. He's involved in porpoise biology, so he's a porpoise expert himself. But B, he is a technological guru and whiz. And he knows uh, what I know about the technology that we use today, you could write on the back of a postage stamp. Um, what Marcus knows about it, you probably could fill several books with. And um, to do this kind of event uh, involving all this amazing technology and bringing people in from all around the world, obviously, is something that requires uh, a lot of technical know-how and um, expertise. And Marcus, uh, you did an amazing job. So I really want to thank you dramatically. Uh, for your help and uh, everything that you did. Um, and finally, um, I just want to close by thanking all the people who joined us today. Um, for those of you who joined us live, I really appreciate that. And maybe some people from uh, weird time zones. I know Tilan is uh, probably starting to get real sleepy right now. He's like me and goes to bed at 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night um, because it's a strange hour for him over there. But also all the viewers um, who joined us from all over the world, uh, really want to thank you for your, um, uh, being, your attention and your um, participation in this event. And um, for anybody who weren't, wasn't able to watch the entire event live and wants to watch it, um, I know that it's being recorded and it will be available um, for watching at least on YouTube and maybe on some of the other uh, streaming platforms as well. That's so, right. We'll, um, we'll be on, on all those platforms. And uh, and Tom, you're, you're making the sound as if you're cutting off, but uh, we are actually going to go back to uh, to uh, show some of Julius's work because he's done amazing work uh, that nobody could be watching uh, while all those talks were happening. His Vaquita uh, has grown to um, to become a real family, a Vaquita family now, and uh, we're going to show some of that and uh, get some final closing words uh, from us over here uh, in, in Canada as well. Excellent. Okay. Um, Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you so much, everyone. That was a really informative panel. I have so many questions. I will approach you uh, separately to pick your brains. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. And I wanna, I wanna, thank th I wanna, I wanna thank one voice that wasn't a voice here because she doesn't have a microphone, but my co-director, my wife Christine, is in <laughs> in the room next door and is actually watching this program and has been keeping us uh, on time. She's our timekeeper as well. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's it with all the voices. Um, <laughs> uh, Lauren, are we are we together? Are we gonna have a look at what Julius has done? I'm so excited to see it. Julius has been uh, studiously at work over here. I think, uh, yeah, I, it's it's really awesome. I think everyone's going to love this. Uh, okay, we can hear there you too Okay, good. Yeah, well, there you go. Um, can you see that now? Is it on? Yes, okay, it's excellent. on screen. So there we go. I pretty much finished it up in the meantime here. So it's actually done, done better than the previous years where um, where I didn't get to do as much of it. But this one was, it was a little bit more... Um, uh, bite-sized, I guess, so to speak, and uh, so yeah, I got a, a you know one one parent vaquita, for example, here maybe, and then then a, a calf right behind, and uh, they're swimming along, hopefully into the future. And there's another maybe another member of a, the community nearby as well swimming behind. So just kind of fill in the background a little bit, and of course, the message that uh, 
we all want basically to carry forward is that we want these to survive. And so Viva Vaquita is, 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 is my, uh, you know, um, hope here basically is that we want them to, to go into the future and, and continue to spread, to increase in numbers. Can you imagine the day when we could actually see their numbers start to increase again? Oh my God, that would be amazing. Especially at that speed. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. But like that bunnies. would be so wonderful. That That's like the, the biggest reward for anybody involved in conservation is to see the 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 species start to increase in number. And that's just so wonderful to see that kind of a thing. And there is hope. As um, everybody's been saying today, there's scientific evidence that there's hope that this small population, if the threat's removed, could potentially recover and, and grow. And this is wonderful news. So yeah, so I dedicate my artwork to all the, the wonderful people that have done so much wonderful work here. The researchers, the fishermen that have been employing alternative methods and taking care to protect uh, the, the environment for the vaquita. Um, everybody out there, all of you who are concerned and are doing whatever you can to help out. Um, yeah, this is all for you and I, I'm just happy to be a part of this community. I think you pointed out too, yeah, there's a lot of um, Tom at the end there was, you know, talking about the, the people involved. And, and I think there are so many unsung heroes yeah. involved. We last year talked to some students who were super active and, and, um, anyone else there who's a student and helping with that research, whatever you're doing, job well done. Thank you so much. But we do want to thank you so much for joining us here today. And, uh, we're grateful for your attention, your your brain power, whatever it is that you can uh, can give here, vaquita and all the other similar species facing similar challenges. We need to be drawing attention to them. So thank you for being a part of that. Thank you so much to everyone involved. And I think we're gonna we're gonna end it there. We'll leave you with some images of uh, those vaquita again that uh, Julius made. But thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>